A long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away, Star Wars, The Last Jedi, by Michael Reeves and Maya Catherine Bonoff, read for you by Joe Funderburk of Decade Bird Publishing. The Jedi are extinct. Their fire has gone out in the universe. Grand Moff Tarkin Part 1 Vaster Than Empires One. Sakian Freighter, Far Ranger, requesting clearance for departure. I-5's mimicry of Tudin Sal's gruff voice was flawless. No one listening, or more to the point, no vocal analyzer scanning, would know that in reality, the Sakian merchant was sitting in a safe house somewhere in the Twilight Warren near Westport, plotting infamy against the Empire. No one that was except for the Far Ranger's crew and her lone passenger. Jax Pavan, his hands on the Far Ranger's steering yoke, realized he was holding his breath as he waited for the Westport flight dispatcher to approve their departure plan. He let his tension go with a soft rush of air and ignored the urge to reach out with the force to give the dispatcher a nudge. It was tempting, but best not to take the chance. Even something as minor as that could alert Darth Vader to their movements, if Vader was, against all odds, still alive. Jax believed that he was. Even though he hadn't sensed the Dark Lord's uniquely powerful indentation in the fabric of the Force lately, it was difficult to conceive of such power, such concentrated evil, being gone, being over, being done and until he gazed upon Vader's corpse with his own eyes, until he could reach out and touch him with the tendrils that constituted his own connection with the living force and sense no reciprocation. Well, until that came to pass, Jax knew he couldn't be too careful. And speaking of erring on the side of caution, was the silence on the comlink just a little too long? Had someone suspicious of the freighter's relatively new Sakian registry connected the ship to Jack's Pavan? Am I overthinking this? Far Ranger, your ascent plan is approved. Your departure window is... There was a pause, and Jax held his breath again. I-5 glanced at him and let two pearls of luminescence migrate left to right along the top outside rims of his photoreceptors the droid's equivalent of rolling his eyes. Ten standard minutes on my mark. Aye, said I-5. Mark. Beginning ascent. I-5 cut the comlink and turned to Jax. She's all yours, and not a single battlecruiser on our tail that I can see. Jax ignored the droid's sarcasm. His left hand eased forward on the thruster control, as his right pulled up and back on the steering yoke. The ship, a modified Corellian Action 6 transport, lifted from the spaceport docking bay into the night sky, which, even at this elevation, was a blaze of ambient light. Jax felt the vibration of the ship through the yoke, felt it merge with his desire to be away from Coruscant, until it seemed, to him, that Far Ranger itself yearned above all things to leap into hyperspace before even clearing the atmosphere. The sky changed. It warmed to twilight, to daybreak, to full day, then cycled back again through dusk and twilight as they soared, finally, into the flat black of space. They saw no stars. The glorious blaze of the city planet's night side was enough to drown out even the nearby nebulae of the core completely. I-5 sent a last message back to flight control in Tudin Sal's gravelly tones. Far Ranger away! Aye, clear skies! 
The droid shut down the comlink, and Jax navigated above the orbital plane, adjusted course, and set the autopilot to their first jump coordinates. Then he sat back to clear his head. He felt a touch in his mind and on his arm. Loranth. He turned his head to look up at her. She was grinning at him. Or at least, she was doing something that was as close to grinning as she was likely to get. One whole corner of her mouth had curled upward by at least a millimeter. Nervous, are we? She asked. I could feel you angsting all the way up in the weaponry bay. What were you doing up there? Getting the feel of the new triggering mechanism. Nervous, are we? Jack's mimicked, smiling. Being proactive. She gave his arm a squeeze and glanced out the viewport. I'll be glad to be out of this gravity well. Too much traffic here by half. Any one of those ships? She nodded toward their closest companions in flight. A Toydarian grain transport. Another Corellian freighter. A private yacht. Could be targeting us right now. You're being paranoid, Jax assured her. If Vader were watching us, I'd know. We'd know. Vader watching us? Now there's a cheery thought. Din Durr stepped onto the bridge and slid into the seat behind Jax. I'm hoping he's watching us from beyond the crematorium. Paranoia, I-5 said. Another human emotion I just don't get. The list of things both animate and inanimate in this galaxy that are capable of utterly annihilating you is longer than a superstring. Yet real danger evidently isn't enough. You organics aren't happy without making up a bevy of boogeymen to scare you even more. Jax said nothing. In the months since their last confrontation with the Dark Lord, a confrontation in which one of their whiplash team had betrayed them and another self-immolated trying to assassinate Vader. They had heard not even a whisper about either his whereabouts or his condition. There had been no reports on the holonet, no rumors from highly placed officials, no speculation or stories by various life forms in places like the Black Pit slums or the Southern Underground. It was as if the very concept of Vader had vanished along with his corporeal form. And yet, Jax still couldn't believe that his nemesis was dead, as much as he wanted to. The entire scenario had been too perfect. In the thrall of a potent drug that enhanced force abilities in unpredictable ways, Vader had lashed out wildly, trying to fend off his would-be assassin. The release of energy had been enough to vaporize the unfortunate Hananim Tik Renan, who'd pushed Vader over the edge, in more ways than one. Both of them had fallen a great distance. Renan had died. Vader had vanished. If Darth Vader had been a normal human being, or even a normal Jedi, Jax could assume he was dead as well, but he was neither of those things. He was at once less and more than human, at once less and more than a Jedi. He was a powerful merger of the human and the inhuman. He was a Sith, who had once called Jax friend. For Jax suspected, no, more than suspected, knew that Darth Vader had somehow once been Anakin Skywalker. He had sensed it through the Force, and in their last encounter, Vader had confirmed it with a slip of the tongue that might well have been intentional. The man who wouldn't die. You going to share that load with us, Jax? Din was looking at him with eyes that only seemed lazy. Have you sensed anything about Vader since... The Sullustan made a boom gesture with both stubby-fingered hands. Jax shook his head. Nothing. But Din, if he died, I think I'd know that. There would have been a huge shift in the Force if a being of that much focused power was destroyed. I saw the flaming backwash from Ground Zero, Din objected. That wasn't a shift? No, that was a light show mostly flash with a little substance. It was enough to kill Renan, but I don't think it killed Vader. The Sullustan looked to Loranth. No joy from you either? 
Sorry, Din. I'm of the same opinion. He might be severely injured and in a Bacta tank somewhere, but he's not dead. The most we can hope for is that he'll be out of commission long enough for us to get Yimon to safety. You just came from Yimon, didn't you? Jax asked Din, and at the Celestin's nod, he added, How does he seem? Din shrugged. About like you'd expect a guy to seem who's nearly been dead four times in the last three weeks. Jax took a deep breath and let it out slowly. Those near hits were why they were moving Thaizan Yimon from Coruscant. The leader of the anti-imperial resistance cell known locally as Whiplash had been targeted a number of times in the past weeks by imperial forces. In two cases, only the fact that Jax and his team had a friend on the police force, a Zabrak prefect named Paul House, had tipped them to the threat in time to avoid it. In a twisted way, the imperial attention to Whiplash and Yemon in particular was flattering. It meant they had risen from mere annoyances to serious threats. Perhaps the Empire had even made the connection between the local resistance on Imperial Center and the broader movement that was springing up on a growing number of far-flung worlds. In practical terms, this meant that, over the last several months, the Imperial Orders had gone from shoot them if they get in the way to ferret them out, track them down, and destroy them. The Emperor had also changed tactics. Absent from these recent attempts at annihilation were the force-sniffing, raptor-like inquisitors. Now the attacks came from force-insensitive bounty hunters and battle droids. It was as if, having failed to turn the gifts of the Force against Yemon and his cohort, the Emperor was simply throwing every mundane weapon in his arsenal at them. Jax wanted to believe these were the acts of a desperate tyrant who had just lost his most potent weapon. He wanted to believe it as much as he wanted to believe that Vader was gone. But the man who wouldn't die. He shook himself, realizing he had come to think of Darth Vader as inevitable and immortal. Whatever hideous truth lay behind that feeling... Jax could not let it distract him from the hard reality that the Empire wanted Whiplash dead and buried. The Empire, being the hierarchical beast that it was, figured this was best done by destroying the brains of the organization. But Yimon, with his dual cortex and a personal cell of operatives that included a Jedi, a Grey Paladin, and a sentient droid, was a hard man to kill or capture. Still... The last attempt had come close. Too close. Way too close. It had taken out several storefronts and more than a dozen innocent citizens who happened to be too near a tavern that the whiplash had used to pass messages. Jax couldn't shake the memory of the street in the aftermath of that attack. The bodies littering the walkway, the sharp smell of ozone in the heavy air, the photonic imprints of people on the walls of the buildings, reverse shadows caught at the instant of death, the hushed sense that the entire neighborhood was holding its breath, readying a roar of outrage, a roar that would fall on deaf ears. Outrage against the Empire seemed futile. Jax had to believe it was not. The decision to move the Resistance leader from Imperial Center had been almost unanimous. The sole dissenting voice had belonged to Yemon himself. Only a great deal of convincing had finally gotten him to agree that relocating their base of operations to Dantooine was the wisest move, and none too soon. Jax shook off the feeling of dread that threatened to settle over him. For the hundredth time that day, he opened his mouth to tell Laurent about the summons he'd gotten three days earlier from a Cephalon whiplash informant. But caution, and Din's presence kept the words from his tongue. I'm going back to talk to Yimon, he said, rising. Take the helm. Laranth nodded and slid into his seat. Jax turned to I-5. Ping me when we're about to jump to hyperspace, okay? You don't trust us to enter the corridor correctly? asked the droid. Laranth merely looked at Jax through her large, peridot-colored eyes. Of course I trust you, 
I just need a front row seat for the jump. Yeah, I know it's not rational, he added when I-5 made a testy clicking sound. I just need to see the stars change. That all right with you? As you wish, Droid and Twi'lek said in eerie unison. Jax thought he heard Din Dur chuckle softly. He found Thizon Yaman sitting at a duraplast table fashioned to look like wood. It looked like wood for no other reason than that Jax liked wood on extended missions in space, which seemed to happen increasingly as resistance activity picked up and spread. He wanted to be reminded that somewhere there were worlds with forests alive and growing. He had a real tree in his quarters, a tiny thing in a ceramic pot. It was a gift from Loranth, and was many hundreds of years old, though it remained tiny. I-5 had shown Jax how the masters of an ancient art form called Misai trimmed and guided the branches. Jax had learned to do it using delicate tendrils of the Force. The practice had become a meditation. So, too, had going through the forms of lightsaber combat with his new weapon, a lightsaber he and Loranth had constructed using a crystal that had come to him from an unexpected source. The weapon's weight was a comforting presence against his hip, no less comforting than being able to stow the Sith blade he'd been using. He'd had no time to meditate in the last two days. He'd told himself it was because of their aggressive timeline for moving Yimon off-world. He knew better. It was because meditating led to thinking about the message the Cephalon had given him. Time, for a Cephalon, was a somewhat malleable substance. Plastic, a philosopher or physicist might have said. Din called it squishy. Whatever modifier seemed most appropriate, it all came down to the same thing. Cephalons saw time as other sentients saw spatial relationships. Something might be before you or behind you or beside you, but if you turned your head to look, it was visible. If you walked around an object, you could see different sides of it, gain different perspectives. A crude analogy, but approximate to the way Cephalons saw time. A moment might be before them, or behind them, or on top of them future or past or present, yet they could but turn their immensely complex minds and perceive it, move around it, and view it from different points. This perception might, or might not, have had something to do with the fact that Cephalons had what was known variously as augmented or punctuated intelligence. This meant that they had, in addition to one big brain, several sub-brains, ganglionic nodes, really, that took care of more atavistic body functions and left the big brain free to do, well, whatever it did. Through his connection to the Force, Jax had occasionally come close to grasping the reality of this. But even a Jedi couldn't fathom the precise nature of the Cephalon's relationship to time. And alas, what Cephalons could not do terribly well was communicate what they perceived. Tenses were lost on them, what happened the previous day or last century was as present as something that would happen the next day or a century in the future. And since they were linked to one another through the Force, a Cephalon might very well be able to see something that hadn't happened or would not happen in its own lifetime. Which was why receiving a message from a Cephalon whiplash operative before a mission was, to Jax Pavan, a severe test of his Jedi patience. He often sent the more dispassionate I-5 to interview Cephalons, but this time that hadn't been an option. When Jax had received this message, I-5 had been off with Din Dur and Tudin Sal, securing a series of bogus ship's ident codes that might be needed for their journey to Dantooine. So he'd gone by himself, back into their old neighborhood, near Plowtechel Market, to meet with a Cephalon who'd installed itself in a residence that catered to non-oxygen-breathing life forms. Cephalons preferred methane and liked their atmosphere a little on, as Den put it, the chewy side. Jax had arrived at the Cephalon's address in heavy disguise. To outsiders, he appeared to be an Elemen diplomat, just the sort of visitor a Cephalon might be expected to have. 
diplomats and politicians were always looking for an edge when it came to future or past events. The Cephalons had no scruples about divulging information. They merely were incapable of communicating it clearly. Jax found the alien in a loft that was considered grand by Cephalon standards. Within the methane-infused habitat, it kept a variety of kinetic fountains, sculptures, and art wall displays. The Cephalons liked movement. The huge being, whose designation, Eoloi Loa, loosely meant the one before Lo and after Ill, lived behind a huge glass-walled barrier in which it floated in its soup of methane like a gigantic mottled gray melon. It ate and communicated via a baleen that strained nutrients from the methane soup and vibrated to give form to thoughts that were displayed on a panel in an antechamber outside its inner sanctum. The name, Jax knew, was for the benefit of other sentients the Cephalons interacted with, a means for those temporally challenged souls to distinguish between individuals. Presumably, the Cephalons had their own mysterious way of doing that. Jax had announced himself using the translation device next to the Cephalon's display panel. I, being Jax Pavan, come as bidden. Now warn me of an imperial plot. The Cephalon, of course, did nothing of the kind. Instead, it asked a question. Depart, you have will? Jax blinked. Clearly a question about a future event. Yes. Crux. The word typed itself onto the display panel. Crux? repeated Jax. What kind of crux? Nexus, said Aoloi Loa. Locus. Dark. Crosses. Has crossed. Will cross. Light. Yes, I know what a crux is. What does it mean in this case? That crux. Choice, is, has been, will be, loss. Indecision, is, has been, will be, all loss. Jax waited, but the Cephalon did not elaborate. What does that mean? Choice is loss. Indecision is all loss? It means what it means. Everything. Jax kept his thoughts composed with effort. Listen, he told himself. Listen. Whose choice? he asked. Whose indecision? Mine? Choice upon choice. Decision upon decision. Indecision is, was, will be cumulative. Indecision over a period of time? or the cumulative indecision of a number of people. The cephalon bobbed up and down slowly, then turned away from the transperistyle barrier that protected it from the oxygen-nitrogen atmosphere of Coruscant. So, silently, Jax had been dismissed. He walked back to the art gallery and event center that served as Whiplash headquarters, pondering the cephalon's words, Choice is loss. Indecision is all loss. Any way he interpreted that, it did not sound good. Jax stopped in the hatchway of the Far Ranger's crew's commons, studying the whiplash leader where he sat at the faux wood table. You're still not resigned to this, are you? He asked finally. Would you be, if you were being asked to relocate and leave the heart of your operations? The only reason I agreed to this is that if the Emperor suspects I've moved, he may focus his efforts on finding me and give the network on Coruscant some relief. The attack near Sill's place was too close, Yaman, and the loss of innocent life involved. The Syrian nodded wearily. Yes, that too. That bloodbath was unforgivable. That he would send battle droids... Have them kill indiscriminately and widely. Apparently, they knew we were in the area, but their information wasn't precise enough to target effectively. Photonic charges gave them a shot at killing some of us without extreme damage to the infrastructure. 
Jax couldn't keep the sarcasm out of his voice. Maybe. And maybe. What? The Syrian shook his immense head. You said it yourself once. It felt as if the Emperor were desperate. If Vader is out of the way for a while, and the Inquisitors can't track us without you sensing them, that makes some sense. But... Jax felt a niggle of unease, but shook it off. He understood the Cephalon's warning, he told himself, and heeded it. Are you suggesting the Emperor might not be as desperate as he seems? Jax asked Yaman. The Syrian sighed, his breath rumbling deep in his broad, muscular chest. Let us just say that I have never known Emperor Palpatine to be prone to panic. But, as I said... With his champion out of the way. Any more intel from our informants? None. No one has seen Vader or heard so much as a rumor about his condition since your last meeting. Their last meeting. In which Vader had tried to punish Jax for still being Jedi. In which he had cultivated a traitor within Jax's team. In which he had tried to make use of a rare biological agent to enhance his own connection to the Force. Jax found it ironic that, in his unenhanced state, Vader might have succeeded in capturing or killing him, along with all his companions. But the Dark Lord had overreached and defeated himself. There was a lesson in that about hubris and impatience. Jax wondered if Anakin Skywalker, imprisoned in that towering black survival suit, held together by cybernetic implants, would recognize it. Then this is a window of opportunity, Jack said. To be timid now, timid? Yaman laughed. Am I not showing timidity by running? No, you're showing wisdom. Whiplash needs you. The growing resistance needs you. The emperors flailing around almost got you killed. Thizon Yaman looked up at Jax with steady eyes the color of old bronze. What if he's not flailing around, Jax? What if there is a method to these attacks? Jax pushed away the cold that tried to invade his core. Then we'll remove ourselves from harm's way. Look, Yaman, if he'd known Sill's place was the pass-through for our operatives, he would have simply taken it off the map. If he'd known where our base of operations was he would have sent his bounty hunters and his battle droids and his inquisitors there and killed us in our sleep. What could he possibly have to gain by plunging randomly around like a rancor in bloodlust? Perhaps what he has gained, my leaving Coruscant, my disconnecting myself from the battle long enough to relocate and regroup, long enough for him to regroup. This may be a window of opportunity for the Emperor, too. Jax levered himself away from the hatch frame. I've told you, if you want my team to stay with you on Dantooine... The whiplash leader shook his head wearily. No, Tudin Sal needs you on Coruscant. He's unhappy enough that you're the one serving as my nursemaid on this voyage. He's right. I'd talk you out of this if I could. I'd like to have our best near Palpatine, and Vader, if he re-emerges. If? No, not if. Jax knew it was really only a matter of when. 2. Their route to Dantooine had been decided in a heated consultation during which Laranth and I-5 argued for a direct shot into wild space and from there into Mito's arrow while Tudin Sal and Thizan Yaman counseled that they take a more mundane approach along a heavily traveled trade lane. Mito's arrow was a narrow corridor that would take them from the fringes of the galaxy directly to Dantooine through a patch of unstable space stressed by the gravitational tides of a particularly violent binary star system most pilots called simply the Twins. Its saving virtue was that the heavily fluctuating magnetic fields around the binary pair cloaked any attitude changes a ship made as it passed by. Theoretically, a master pilot with an enemy in pursuit could flee into the binary's gravity coil, drop out of hyperspace just long enough to make a radical course change, 
then leap again in a completely different direction while the pursuer tried to figure out which way he'd gone. The mere mention of Maito's arrow made Tudensal's face pucker. His recommendation that they make port on Bandemir made Laurent's eyes roll. There's still a pronounced imperial presence on Bandemir, Sal, she objected. After Vader crushed the miners' revolt last year, the Emperor has kept a watchful eye on things. Which is why no one would expect a ship full of subversives to make port there, Sal argued. You would be just one more cargo ship doing its mundane business in an imperial port. Unfortunately, Thizon Yemon had made the call. What's less remarkable than a freighter stopping at regular ports of call? I think Sal's right. If anyone does suspect Far Ranger of being anything more than what she seems, they may well have lost interest when all we do is drop into a series of ports to offload and take on cargo. And so they had ended up here, on the well-plied Hydean Way, headed out toward the corporate sector. Except that they had no intention of going that far. They would make port on Bandemir, communicate briefly with the nascent resistance cell there, then move on, stopping sequentially at Bodichev, Selenon, Ferii Junction, and Toprawa, where they would contact the remnant of the Antarion Rangers. The Rangers, little less reviled by the Emperor than the Jedi, had disappeared from the Empire's scanners, but they were far from dead. There was, in Jax Pavan's heart, a deep but fragile hope that perhaps the same was true of the Jedi, that perhaps he was not, as he often suspected, the last one. At Bandemir there was indeed an imperial presence. There were also one or two inquisitors, which meant that Jax and Loranth remained aboard Far Ranger in a state of dormancy. I-5 and Din carried out the placating necessary to barter for Ionite which also resulted in contact and exchange of information with members of the Bandemir version of Whiplash. Ionite was a substance of extraordinary properties. It cancelled out whatever charge it was presented with, be it negative or positive, which made it ideal for defeating such devices as shield generators and communications grids. It had also proved an effective component in weaponry, which made it valuable to the resistance. Cargo holds full of ore and ingots, Far Ranger lifted again and continued her sojourn, making several ports of call along the Hydean Way, and navigating the final leg with an amount of ionite sufficient to the needs of their allies on Toprawa. They made Toprawa ten days after leaving Coruscant. Their plan? To pause there before backtracking slightly to pick up the Thesme Trace toward Dantooine. Toprawa was a world whose temperate zones were covered with lush forests that encroached on every port and outpost. The small spaceport they called at was on the outskirts of Big Woolly Township in the cool northern reaches of a major landmass. Big Woolly, Jax had learned, was a reference to the appearance of the nearby mountain range with its fleece of native conifers. They elected to berth away from the main docking complex on an open landing pad, intending to call as little attention to themselves as possible. It was near sunset when Jax debarked from Far Ranger to find himself surrounded by massive conifers whose sweet, tangy perfume overwhelmed the mechanical sense of the spaceport. He was overwhelmed, as well, by the sheer vividness and vitality of the forest. It was neither as lofty as the growth on the Wookiee homeworld as Kashyyyk, nor as lush as the rainforest of Rhodia, but it wrapped the constructed artifacts of the spaceport with teeming life. It was exhilarating and soothing at once, and Jax wished for a moment that they could simply stay here, all of them, and make Toprawa their new headquarters. Majestic, aren't they? Yaman was at his elbow, gazing across the durasteel landing pad at the sentinel spikes of ruddy bark and blue-green foliage, now tinged with gold from the planet's lowering sun. And amazing how something as massive and enduring as these trees 
should also be flexible enough to bend to the wind. Jax took in that feature of the surrounding giants, deeply rooted, ancient, strong, and connected to the larger force of nature, yet they bowed and shifted at the invisible promptings of wind and weather. He supposed there was a lesson of some sort there. I envy the rangers their capital, Yaman sighed, though Dantooine is not unpleasant. Jack smiled. Does this remind you of home? The Syrian nodded. Still, I've rarely seen trees this tall on my homeworld. There is a vibrancy here that is intoxicating. Jax had to agree. The cool, moist air was heady. He breathed deeply of it. It reminded him of the scent given off by his tiny Nisai tree when he caressed its branches with his fingertips, or with the force. They say, Yaman said, that the force flows in the sap of forest like these. Who says? Loranth came out onto the landing ramp to survey the Taprawan landscape. Kiadi Mundi for one, said Yaman. A member of the Jedi High Council, Kiadi, a Syrian, had led the Grand Army of the Republic through several key battles, only to die in the violence and treachery of Order 66. He was a particular hero of Thizon Yaman. Loranth smiled. Jax knew what she was thinking. How bemusing that a man of Yemon's heroic stature should have heroes of his own. Well then, she said, if General Kiati said it, it must be so. She stretched out a hand toward the trees and closed her eyes as if testing the truth of her own hero's words. Curious, Jax reached out as well with tendrils of the force, probing the fringes of the forest, caressing the branches and boughs, feeling the texture of bark and needle, tasting the life force of the sap. Yes, it was there, a silken fabric of force energy, like a murmur of sound, an undercurrent of vibration, an ambient throb of light. It was lovely, cool and deep as the shadows. Shadows? His thoughts eddied. Had there been a flicker, the merest shiver, of something not of the forest? Jax blinked and glanced about the landing pad. Another vessel, meters away, had just drawn in its landing ramp and was revving up its engines. Perhaps the ripple in the energy of Toprawa's verdure had come from there. Are we going to stand here all night admiring the scenery? I-5 exited the ship with a whisper of servos. I had thought we were supposed to make contact with an important customer. Yeah, the sun's going down, said Din. Aren't we supposed to see a lady about some ore? Jax nodded. He thought about the fleeting extrasensory impression that he'd just encountered and decided it must have been some eddy or backwash. Right. Loranth and I will make contact. I-5, if you could get the cargo ready to offload, consider it done. Disguised. Jax and Loranth made their way to Big Woolly. The small city had grown up around the spaceport, a crescent of tightly clustered businesses and homes that fanned out from the port facility, roughly five kilometers across at its widest point. The inn at which they were to meet their contact was at the northern tip of the crescent along a curving avenue whose businesses catered largely to merchants. It was a respectable meeting place for successful ship owners and merchants. Hence, the disguises that Jax and Laurent had adopted allowed them to fit into the clientele. Jax, in a tailored synth silk suit and gleaming black boots, looked the part of a successful freighter captain. Laurent, ostensibly his business partner, wore the flowing, diaphanous robes that declared her a member of a merchant clan. She'd also affected a pair of vivid orange, silky, bell-trimmed mantles over her leku, thus effectively concealing both her truncated left leku and her emotions. The damaged leku was an old injury Laurent had received in a firefight. It was also an identifying feature that she usually declined to mask. Now, though, it was critical to conceal both identity and telltale changes in hue. 
Her blasters were concealed. Jax had left his lightsaber with I-5. This was not the sort of place one advertised the bearing of arms, and he wanted no one to suspect that he was a Jedi. As part of her headgear, Loranth also wore a medallion that, like the Leku mantles it adorned, was more than just stage dressing. It was a sigil that was meaningful only to its intended target, an Antarian ranger. They entered the large main room of the Mossy Glen Inn and looked around. Jax smiled. How different this was from entering Sill's place where everyone contrived to look at you without seeming to look at you, or the Twilight Taverna off Plauteca Market, where everyone in the room turned to assess each newcomer's potential to be exploited in some fashion. Here, they drew only the most casual of glances. Jax sensed momentary admiration of their physical appearance, but no clandestine regard. The variety of sentience was not remarkable in any way. There were life forms from a dozen worlds, though human colonists seemed the best represented group. All were well dressed and well curried, to their species standards, and all seemed to be enjoying a good meal, a good drink, a good laugh, or a good haggle. Loranth looked around the room with a brisk, business like gaze, then led the way to the staircase that rose upward into the softly lit reaches of the second floor. It was quieter up here, and duskier. Little lamps flickered on the tables, and a huge fireplace at the far end of the room sent light and shadow dancing over every surface. The shadows would not stand still and be recognized as one thing or another. Ambiguity. Jax found it suddenly discomforting, for reasons he had no time to contemplate. He felt a subtle shift in Laurent's energies, a sharpening of her regard. She strode down the length of the room to a semicircle booth at the right flank of the great hearth. Jax followed. A woman sat at the booth. She was dressed in a sleek cutaway coat with synth fur collar and cuffs. Her hair was drawn back in a tight coil at the nape of the neck, and her gray eyes were bright and assessing. Jax suspected that the skirt of her coat concealed a number of weapons. Loranth inclined her head. Greetings. Do I have the pleasure of addressing Arin Foley? You do, replied the other woman, dipping her head minutely. And you are? Paula Ducal, said Loranth. This is my partner, Corin Vigil. Foley nodded in greeting. Her expression was one of polite interest. No more. We bring a message from a common friend, a Syrian gentleman of your acquaintance, recently from Imperial Center. Foley's eyes lit. How is he? He is well. He speaks highly of you and recommends that we do business. Foley indicated the seats opposite her. Please. They slid into the booth. How confidential are our dealings? Jax asked, glancing around the subtly lit room. Foley didn't answer right away. Instead, she reached up and palmed a medallion she wore around her neck with a thick metal torque. Very confidential now, she said. If anyone's snooping, they're getting only the most deadly boring of trade talks fabricated from our actual conversation so we ought to discuss a bit of trade to give the dialogue generator some fuel. Jax was intrigued. He heard rumors about the sort of anti-surveillance device they were apparently now being screened by. Its ionite circuitry didn't so much jam snoop signals as feed them cobbled together dialogues that made sense of the raw material of actual conversation. It required only that the speakers clutter their verbal trail with just enough innocuous debris to fool potential eavesdroppers. The device screened out programmed hot words and phrases, but as far as any surveillance systems were concerned, no jamming was taking place. Nothing could be easier, said Laurent. As it happens, we've got a cargo hold that contains enough ionite to gum up a whole shipload of surveillance snoops. And in return... One of those lovely medallions you're wearing, for one thing, 
said Laranth. We could really use that tech at home. And information, Jack said, about the Imperial presence in this sector. Foley grimaced. Well, there is a presence, or at least the dregs of one. Messed up my last big mission really good. Killed a lot of resources, both material and personal. Understood, said Jax. We've sustained our own losses, which is, frankly, the reason our mutual friend is moving his base of operations. Two, as any pilot would say, to the point. Jax drew on the tabletop with one fingertip, a long diagonal line. He dotted the end of it with a sharp tap. Foley frowned, then nodded in comprehension. Any pilot would know that the planet at the point of Maito's arrow was Dantooine. She glanced up, caught the attention of a serving droid, and ordered drinks and a plate of finger food, necessary items for serious and amicable negotiations. When the droid had trundled off with their order, the ranger leaned toward Jackson Laranth, looking from one face to the other. Does this move mean that we are close to incorporating our efforts and moving against our competitors together? The question was earnest and had behind it the weight of deep and visceral disappointment and loss. Arin Foley may have spoken casually of the killing of resources, but her feelings about it were far from casual. Jax exchanged a glance with Laranth. Closer, perhaps, very close to orchestrating those efforts, more effectively at least. That was one of the incentives our friend had in relocating. Where he was based was increasingly bad for his health, Laranth finished. Communication with satellite organizations was difficult at times. Though there is something to be said for hiding in plain sight. Or getting lost in a crowd, added Jax. Unfortunately, our competitors are making it hard to stay lost. Foley nodded thoughtfully. Communication is not an issue here. We have a most effective network that gets to the point quite efficiently. But about the, um, competition in the area... It is, at times, most fierce. Recently, for example, the trade route between here and the Tello system was overrun with our competitors' ships. They're big boys, too. Far outweigh anything we lowly little rangers can put in the space lanes. So if your cargo holds are modest, they are. Laranth and Jax said in unison. Foley smiled. Then I'd advise against even bothering going any farther up the Hydean Way. This is as good a place as any to replot your course. Their food and drink arrived, and they made a show of imbibing before they settled into conversation once more. Setting up an arrangement for the offload of as much of the Ionite as their allies on Toprawa could make use of. Coming back this way? Ranger Foley asked as they concluded their arrangements. Jax looked up and met Laurent's eyes briefly before saying, We hadn't planned on it. We figured to take a more direct route back to Imperial Center. Foley's gray eyes widen. You're going back to Imperial Center? Why? We have interest there, as you might expect, Jax explained. Business to see to. And people counting on us, added Laurent. You could have that here too, you know, Foley said. I could really use a couple of associates with your... talents. She had Jax's attention. Our talents? Clearly you both have a connection to the Force. I'd heard that our friend was working with a couple of especially talented individuals. Individuals whom the Emperor found of particular interest. I suspect he meant you two. Jax looked at Laranth. Was Arin Foley a Force-sensitive? He considered briefly trying to probe her mind, decided against it, if she were sharp enough in the ways of the Force to be either a benison or a menace, she'd notice his efforts. If she wasn't, there was no point to it anyway. What makes you say that? he asked. I'd heard one of these special operatives was a Twi'lek for one thing. And the other? Foley laughed. Subtext. Half of what you said to each other is unspoken and you complete each other's sentences. She sobered quickly and leaned toward them again. I'm serious. We could really use you here. 
This is the best of all worlds. Literally, we're on the main trade route. So there's a lot of covering traffic for our ships and special cargo. But we're far enough from the center of the galaxy that the Empire doesn't normally pay us much attention. We're just an outlying trade center. But I can safely say there's a lot more going on here than meets the Imperial eye. We have an extensive underground, and I do mean underground, network. She glanced down toward the floorboards, then back up. Sound appealing? Loranth sat back in her seat. Of course it does, but... But, concluded Jax, with our friend off-world, someone needs to run the business on Imperial Center. Does it have to be you? Did it? Jax had to admit he'd asked himself that question a number of times in recent weeks. He also had to admit that Toprawa had strong appeal. He shot a glance sideways at Loranth. She was sitting stiffly erect behind a wall of reserve. He couldn't, for once, tell what she was thinking, but he suspected she was a bit outraged by the thought that she and Jax might abandon their operations on Coruscant. He looked back at Foley, smiled regretfully. I'm afraid it does, he said. So we finish each other's sentences. Loranth strolled beside Jax as they made their leisurely way back to the ship. He smiled. Apparently. Next we'll be eating off each other's plates. They walked on in silence until they came within sight of the spaceport. Then Loranth said, What do you think about what Foley proposed? About basing ourselves here? He shrugged. I don't see how we can. Whiplash needs us on Coruscant. Does it? She swung around to face him. Might we not serve the cause better out here? Where our forces are building? It seems to me that this is where the front is. This is where the resistance will become a real force in the galaxy. Jax was stunned. This wasn't the Loranth Tarek he knew. Loranth, the fiercely loyal, the champion of honor and duty. He laughed uncertainly. Who are you and what did you do with Loranth? She made an impatient gesture. Not joking, Jax. On Coruscant, it feels like the walls are closing in. They're learning to read us. Learning to know what sort of situations we involve ourselves in. What sort of people will risk our lives to help. On Coruscant, they're learning how to bait us. How to get to us. Jax raised his eyes to the dark wall of trees that embraced the spaceport. Uncomplicated. Natural. Real ground beneath his feet. The scent of grass and tree needles. The simple susurration of wind. Coruscant, with its barrage of sounds and energies its clutter of angles and jagged, chaotic patterns of light and shadow, seemed suddenly suffocating. It was like living in a hive. There was no distance between you and the next person, and the next person could be an imperial operative with instructions to capture or kill you. If you didn't have your force sense tuned to danger level every minute of every day, you could be caught off guard. Come back to Taprawa and work with the Antarion Rangers... Maybe use it as a base to find other Jedi, if there were any other Jedi, and build a new order? Come back to Toprawa. With Loranth. He brought his eyes back to her face. In the moment, their gazes locked. To do that, to return here with her and blend into the underground network, was something he wanted beyond reason. The desire rose up in him and almost swamped him. Almost. He took a deep breath and let the desire out. We can't just leave Coruscant, Loranth. Tudin Sal has turned out to be a real asset, she argued. He's smart, politically savvy, driven, and still thinks it would be a good idea to assassinate Palpatine. That stopped her. Yes, true, all right, but Paul House can balance that out, don't you think? Paul House isn't, strictly speaking, a member of Whiplash. He's an ally, certainly, but... Yimon had assured them that the Imperial Sector Police Prefect could be trusted, but Jax didn't know how much influence House held over Toot and Sal. Wouldn't you rather be out here? She asked pointedly. She tilted her head back and looked up at the night sky. It glittered with a million stars, the broad swath of pale radiance that was the galactic core 
gleaming like a river of light. It's... Jack's voice caught in his throat. It's not about what we want, Loranth. It's about what the galaxy needs. It needs to be free of darkness. She shivered visibly. Will that ever really happen, do you think? He stepped toward her, put his hands on her shoulders. Loranth, is something wrong? She shrugged free angrily. By the goddess, Jax, tell me one thing that's right. You? Me? Our connection to the Force? He smiled, or at least tried to. The fact that we complete each other's sentences? She took a deep breath, exhaled, and shook her head, making the row of tiny bells that edged her leku mantle sing. Sorry, it's just... Going back to Coruscant feels like going back into a trap. She turned her head toward the landing field, started walking. Let's go make sure the Ionite is ready for our customer. Sure. Jax fell into stride with her. Maybe it was time for them to consider a new base of operations. The far ranger left Toprawa with her nose set toward Siutrik. They would arrive at Dantooine after a series of careful intermediate jumps. Jax piloted the ship as far as the Siutrik system, then adjusted course and relinquished the helm to I-5 to retire to his private quarters. The Misai tree sat atop a column beneath a wash of light. His meditation mat sat before it, and it was there he went now. Sitting cross-legged on the floor, he took a deep breath, focused on the tree, followed the contours of its elegantly turned trunk and branches with his eyes. When he closed his eyes, the image of the tree remained, the spiraling trunk, the uplifted branches, the bristling energy of the needles. He saw it as a figure of pale green light, a ghost image imprinted on his retinas. There is no emotion. There is peace. Peace. He had to dig for that now, delving beneath the slurry of emotions that had been managing since they'd made the decision to move Yimon away from Coruscant. He realized, for the first time, that he had taken it as a sign of failure. It felt, sometimes, as if they were in a constant retreat, running from the Emperor, running from Vader, running from themselves. There is no ignorance. There is knowledge. No. He knew they weren't running. It was a tribute to their success that the Empire had increased its pressure on them, and from his new headquarters, Thaizan Yiman would be far freer to organize a resistance worthy of the name. Out here, Jax told himself, there would be far more opportunities to network with other resistant cells like the one on Toprawa. There is no passion. There is serenity. Toprawa. Arin Foley's world had seemed the seat of serenity, and her offer for them to stay there and work with the Antarion Rangers was, he had to admit, appealing. No, more than appealing. Seductive. There is no chaos. There is harmony. Jax reined in his thoughts. The whiplash needed to be on Coruscant, and right now, at least, he and Loranth needed to be there, too. Maybe later. Maybe if he and Loranth and the others could raise up replacements. Maybe when battles had been won and some balance returned to the Force. There is no death. There is the Force. The image of the Misai tree still burned behind his closed eyelids. It struck him as paradoxical that this tiny specimen, with its fragile sprigs, was a close relation to the towering columns of wood around Big Woolly Spaceport. Both drew life from soil and sun. Both pulsed with life force. Both were at once strong and flexible. There was indeed a lesson in that, he realized, and it turned his thoughts toward the way he had experienced the force, standing amid the trees of Toprawa. It had been different from his normal perception of it. He had always seen it as a web of energies in which he existed. When he used those energies, he saw them as tendrils or ribbons that reached out from his core to interact with the material universe. But on Toprawa, he had experienced the Force as something that flowed from the heart of a world, through the arteries of every forest giant, and into the atmosphere with the oxygen. In his mind's eye, he saw the trees, the great monumental trees, 
rooted in the ground, reaching into the skies, simultaneously moving and still. It was suddenly very still inside Jack's Pavan. He opened his force sense to the Musai, where it sat in its pot of soil. He could see it, then. He could feel it, the force originating in some infinite well, flowing up through the slender trunk and gracefully turned branches, breathing out into the ether. He drew in a deep breath, his mind hovering on the verge of epiphany. He felt an echo from the moment of ineffable peace when months earlier he had for a brief flash touched the hem of the cosmic force. He felt the stirring in his veins and arteries and, wanting it desperately, reached for the realization that was just beyond his grasp and touched the black heart of vacuum. Vader! Jax recoiled literally thrusting himself backward and inward, away from that chill connection. He wanted to believe it had been merely a manifestation of his own apprehension, but he knew it was not. He had felt Vader's touch as surely as he felt the deck of the Far Ranger beneath him. He flung himself up from the meditation mat and out into the passageway. No more than a couple of steps from the curved corridor, he came face to face with Loranth. Her eyes were storm-dark, her expression grim. He needed no verbal confirmation from her. Neither did she need it from him. They had both sensed it. They turned as one and ran for the bridge. 3. Dender stared out through the viewport and considered whether the relief from boredom offered by challenging Thaizan Yaman to a game of Dejaric was worth the extreme humiliation that would inevitably follow. So far, he had been unable to last more than ten minutes against the Syrian. Yemon had an unfair advantage, of course, given his dual courtesies. Din had considered asking if he could possibly turn one of them off, or distract it with the calculation of pi to several thousand places, or some other engrossing pursuit. But that would be whining. He hated whining especially if it issued from his own lips. He stretched, yawned, and glanced over at I-5, who was piloting. Are we there yet? he mumbled. The droid turned his head, fixing his companion with both optics. Obviously, we are not there yet, or we would be there. We are scheduled to drop out of hyperspace in exactly 20 minutes, 33 seconds. Just making conversation. Why? Oh, wait. Let me guess. You're bored. Aren't you? I don't get bored. It is one of the advantages of having a machine intelligence as opposed to an organic one. You biologicals are plagued by the sense of time passing. I have no such issues. Din sat up straight in his seat, staring curiously at the droid. How do you experience the passage of time? Five turned his optics back to the viewport. Which kind? Universal time? As in Tyran's theory? Or hyper time? Uh... Din had only vaguely heard of the draw physicist, Tyran's unification of sublight time and space. And he'd never heard of hyper time. Blasted if he'd let I-5 know that, however. Not like the Cephalons, right? You don't experience time that way. I mean, the way you described it to me once, like objects in space? Ah, yes. I do recall that conversation. I suggested there was a trash bin in your future. You assured me of your ultimate optimism. Yeah, but do you experience time like the Cephalons do? I rather think no one experiences it quite like that. The difference between the way you and I experience time is a function of the way our memories work. Your memory is volatile. Mine... Din gave the droid a sharp glance. Why the hesitation? Mine is not. The droid finished blandly. Unless someone wipes my memory core. Which has happened. Which has happened, agreed I-5. But if no one meddles with it, it remains intact. Mercilessly intact, Din knew. 
Though they had been wiped some twenty years ago, I-5's memories of the death of his friend, Lauren Povan, Jax's father, had been restored in vivid and complete detail, as had the droid's betrayal at the hands of Tudin Sal. Din often wondered how Five could bring himself to work with the Sakian in Whiplash. He doubted he could be so sanguine about it. Despite the fact that Tudin Sal had lost all of his business holdings, had been blacklisted by the Empire, and had to relocate his family to a frontier world where their lives went on without him. The memory of an organic life form, I-5 said, is manipulated by the emotional current that goes along with the events in memory. They change, expand, contract, assume epic proportions, or become submerged in those currents. It is at once a great strength and a great weakness. Din opened his mouth to reply when Jax and Loranth exploded onto the bridge. Drop out of hyperspace and ping the escort, Jax said tersely. Vader's after us. The words were no more than out of his mouth when the far ranger seemed to hesitate like a dancer pausing in mid-step, then dropped back into normal space, her automatic systems taking over to make certain she didn't collide with anything solid or get dragged into a gravity well. Din scrambled out of the co-pilot seat, allowing Jax to slide into place at the console and activate the heads-up display. I-5 swiveled his head to look at Jax. I didn't do that, Jax. I hadn't time. We were just pulled back into normal space. Where? asked Loranth. Apparently, right where someone wants us, said I-5. Din saw what he meant. Other ships were popping into normal space all around them, while millions of kilometers distant, the twins still set the void ablaze with their deadly display. His throat clamped shut, and his extremities felt as if his temperature had dropped by twenty degrees. There were so many of them. They formed a rough half-sphere around Far Ranger, and were moving toward them, seeking to cut off retreat. Jex. Din forced the name between his arid lips. Jax, tell me you have a plan. Are they Imperial? asked Loranth, though she surely knew the answer. Jax didn't answer either question. I make twenty of them. Twenty. Twenty Imperial ships for them? For one tiny rogue freighter? He knows we're aboard, Jax murmured. He knows! Loranth made a noise that was half growl, half moan. How can he even be here? I don't know. He just is. Jax turned to her. Man the dorsal weapons. Din, you take the keel battery. But first, get Yemon into a life pod. You know what he'll say. Get him into a pod. What are you going to do? Din asked. Out of the corner of his eye, he saw Laurent wheel around and disappear into the main passageway. We're going to squeeze between the twins. Din closed his eyes. I didn't need to know that. Then he fled the bridge on his way to Thaizan Yemon. You're serious, said I-5. You really mean to dive between two disintegrating stars? Jax's fingers flew over the navigational console, correcting course, setting speed. Not exactly. Just close enough to two disintegrating stars to mask our signature, then reorient and shoot off toward Dathomir. Dathomir? Can't take a chance on leading him to Bantuin. Too risky. And by shoot off, I assume you mean leap into hyperspace, in the gravity eddies between a white dwarf and a blue giant. Yes. Which is immeasurably risky. Jax paused to throw his metallic friend a tight smile. Didn't say it wasn't risky, Five. Just preferable to the alternative. He put his hands on the co-pilot's steering yoke. Transfer the controls to my station. Transfer. Copy. Jax saw the status light at his station go green, and he punched the ion drive hard. They leapt forward right into the brilliant spangled veil of matter and energy that stretched between the two stars. Behind them now, and above, below, and flanking, the Imperial vessels pursued, closing the net. Jax had a magnified visual of the closest vessels that confirmed his suspicions. This was a large contingent 
of the Dark Lord's 501st attack fleet, known as Vader's Fist. Which one? Jax wondered. Which ship was Vader on? He had no intention of reaching out to know for certain. Somewhere in the phalanx there was a flagship, of that he was certain. Possibly even that big cruiser that was now hanging back behind the smaller vessels. The ship whose gravity generators had no doubt sucked them out of hyperspace. It was the only ship of real size in the formation. The rest were frigates and attack corvettes, with a few TIE fighters thrown in for good measure. You are aware that this is suicide, I-5 said. We don't have a choice. Well, yes we do. Give up or fight. Neither decision is likely to result in any of us living to a ripe old age. Maybe we should have stayed on Soprawa. Maybe we should have. Closer loomed the blue-white river of stellar matter. Closer drew the individual fingers of Vader's fist. Far Ranger bucked, then suddenly seemed to be flying through taffy. The thought was almost funny. The flow of a substance between the stars was something in the nature of a cosmic taffy pool. And they might just end up as a small, crunchy bite amid the creamy star stuff. Jax tilted the ship's bow down and to port very slightly, skimming the shores of the stream. The ship fought him, trying to sail straight to the heart of the white dwarf. He held on, shooting between the dwarf and the giant, through the hurricane of hot plasma being siphoned off by the smaller, denser star. It was like stepping into chaos. Far Ranger was buffeted by a howling inferno. The whole temperature spiked. Exterior temperature registering 5,000 degrees, I-5 reported. Jax closed his eyes, letting the force take him, imagining it as a web of freezing energy around the little freighter. He experienced something he had never felt before, as if the currents and eddies of energy between the two stars were linked through him like reins in his hands. He felt the currents, gently manipulated the reins, navigated the eddies. We'll be out the other side in ten seconds, I-5 informed him. Course is set. Go to hyperdrive on my mark. Copy. Jax looked up at the cron on the heads-up display. Mark in five, four, three, two, one. Belay that, I-5 said. Jax felt it before he saw it. They came out of the binary storm into a pocket formed by another contingent of ships. Proximity alarms screamed, and Jax did the only thing he could do. He flipped the Far Ranger end over end, intending to flee back the way they'd come. They'd have to leap from the matter stream. But the flaw in that plan became immediately apparent as a formation of five ships emerged from the twins' torrent. Jax knew, without probing, that the one in the center of the formation carried Vader. He hit the comm link. We're surrounded! Fire at will! Everything we've got! The response from Laurent and Din was immediate. Laser and charged particle beams sprayed from the Far Ranger's batteries. The barrage from the dorsal battery concentrated on the central ship in the enemy formation. Laurent knew who was on that ship, and knew also that under no circumstances could they let him board. They had one chance, and one chance only, and that was to break the Imperial formation, get back into the tidal flow between the stars, and leap to hyperspace from there. It was beyond suicidal, but there was no choice. They could not let Vader board and take Yamad. Jax drove Far Ranger right at Vader's flagship, and felt a sick wash of dark amusement sweep over him just before the enemy opened fire. The first shots were a warning missing the ship by kilometers, but they swiftly drew closer. In seconds, they'd be raining on the Far Ranger's shields, shields that even with the previous owner's augmentation could not come close to withstanding more than a few seconds of concentrated Imperial firepower. They would buckle, collapse, and then... There was a ping and a pop of ambient light from the communications panel. I-5 reacted instantaneously, returning the ping. Our escorts have found us, he said. Which means we can find them, Jack said. Feed the coordinates to the life pods, then go to Yemon. 
You're not going to abandon ship, only if we have to. Go! The droid sent the coordinates of their escort's telltale and hastened from the bridge. Jax looked up through the viewport. They were bearing down on Vader's ships fast, and the four big fighters flanking him were tightening their formation. A blast of Imperial fire shook the little freighter, glancing off her shields. They were targeting the ion drive. Jax waited for a second shot to hit, then yanked the yoke over hard, sending Far Ranger into a tight spiral. If he'd timed it right, they'd fly, belly up, right beneath the flagship, slicing between it and its nearest neighbor. If. The barrage of fire from the gun batteries continued as they spun. To Vader, it probably looked as if one of his shots had found its mark and sent the whiplash ship out of control. If he wanted them, he'd have to reverse course and follow them back into the matter stream. If the force was with them, he'd be too late. Two clicks from Vader's ship. Jax dropped Far Ranger's bow a fraction more and dived toward the brilliant light. He reached for the hyperdrive controls. And time stood still. Jax felt as if he were diving into water. In one instant, momentum was exchanged for a floating freefall. They'd entered a stasis field. Jax's mind grappled with the idea. A large ship of the line could generate such a field, but for something as small as Vader's cruiser to produce one was flatly impossible. His thoughts laboriously parsed the situation, aware of and frustrated by the field's slowing of his neurons. Fortunately, his Jedi training helped him resist it. Otherwise, he would simply have been frozen in body and brain, and his next conscious awareness would have likely been seeing Vader looming over him. Jax tried to focus. In order to escape the situation, he first had to understand it. The explanation struck him as the ship's spiral slowed further, and he studied the representative dots of the 501st ships arranged on the heads-up display. It came to him then. The answer lay in their disbursement pattern. The stasis field was being generated by the five ships as a unit, spun among them like a spider web. Each ship generating a section of the invisible strands as they flew in a pattern that was flawless and exact. That was likely attributable to the presence of Darth Vader, likely with a select group of his Inquisitors. Jax threw the ship into reverse. The moment seemed to take forever. The hull groaned and shimmied, but they were held fast and being drawn up toward the flagship. He'd figured it out, but too late to implement an escape. Suddenly, he could move again. Subjective time was back to normal. He didn't need the pinging instrumentation to tell him what had happened. The Dark Lord had abandoned the stasis field in favor of a more effective tractor beam, a mistake on his part that Jax would take full advantage of. Jax triggered the comm link. Abandon ship! All hands, abandon ship! He activated the escape klaxon, scrambled out of his pilot seat, and headed aft. The call to abandon ship echoed from Dendur's headset. He was so focused on reorienting himself after the sudden cessation of their plummet toward ultimate doom that the sound of Jax's voice shocked him. He tumbled out of the weapon station and onto the platform beneath the gimbaled chair. The ventral battery was just below the forward cargo bay. Through the cowling, bursts of laser fire illuminated the keel with flashes of bright coherent light. First the stasis field, then a tractor beam, he thought. Why, oh why, didn't we keep some of the ionite? Din hauled himself up the ladder, out of the battery, and into the cargo hold. He paused to orient himself. Jax had said to get to the life pods, but they'd be stuck in the tractor field just as effectively as the ship was. Well, until Vader docked with them for boarding. The thought galvanized him. When Vader docked... The Imperials would have to lower their shields and force Far Ranger to lower hers, and they'd have to turn off their field for a moment. That would be all the time available in which to get the pods away and out of the tractor field. I have to get aft. Din's thoughts imploded as the ship was rocked again by an external force. The bump was followed by the groaning of the hull. All the blood fled from Din's brain. Instinct took over. He scrambled for the cargo bay hatch. He'd just reached it 
when there was a sound like the firing of a thousand thrusters. The lights flickered, then failed completely. The engines fell silent. So did Lorenz's laser cannon. It only now struck him that he'd been hearing her continued fire from the time he'd left his own post, until now. That was good, Din thought. Now the Twi'lek madwoman would have to abandon the Kriffing ship. They were dead in space. No engines, no weapons, no life support. He skidded to a halt as the realization hit him. No life support! Den swallowed his fear, drew his blaster, and started cautiously down the long, fore-and-aft passageway. He'd taken the precaution earlier of fastening his comlink to the collar of his jacket. Now he thumbed it to I-5's frequency. Five, Den here, come in. Silence. Then, just when Den thought he might weep, I-5 here, where are you? Just abaft of the forward hold. You? Amidships, lower deck, heading up. We're being boarded, port side through the cargo bay. Din's knees quaked. On my way to you. He turned and bolted for the nearest ladder. He'd just stepped out onto the upper deck when the sound of groaning metal came again from his right. He choked back a yelp of sheer terror and took off toward the stern as fast as his short legs would carry him. Jax had felt the tremors running through the ship as the Imperial stormtroopers worked at boarding her. He had assiduously not tried to locate Vader. He was working to keep his force signature damped down. The weight of his lightsaber at his hip was some comfort, but he hoped he wouldn't need it. If it came to using his lightsaber, that would mean he'd allowed Vader to get too close. He sped aft in the suffocating gloom, slowing as he reached amidships. Was Loranth still up in the dorsal battery? Surely not. Surely she had abandoned her post on his order. Or not. Loranth could be stubborn. He hesitated, peering into the gloom of the Traverse Passage. But without power, he argued, and with the ship caught in the tractor beam like an insect in amber, she could no longer fire her weapon. She would have opted to protect Yimon. She would have gone for the life pods. He moved forward again. He caught up with I-5 as he stepped out of a stairwell onto the upper deck. Where are Din and Loranth? he asked. Din is on the way, said the droid. And until they knocked out our systems, Loranth was still firing at the Imperials. I assume she's been forced to flee. Jax frowned. Under normal circumstances, he would have simply reached out and found her through the Force. But he couldn't chance that now. Only comfort himself that she had not reached out for him. He looked forward along the starboard passageway. There was nothing to see. He turned his attention aft. She's probably already at the pods. Let's go. There were five life pods in Far Ranger's complement. Two in the stern on each of her two decks port and starboard, and one just abaft the bridge. Each was equipped to hold four people comfortably, five only if they were on very good terms. All of them now held the coordinates of the Antarion escort, but they wouldn't by the time they were all finally deployed. Only the one Jax and his companions took, the one in which Thaizan Yemon awaited them, would rendezvous with their backup. He thanked the Force for Arin Foley. They reached the aft transverse passageway and made their way along it to the first of the life pods. The locking mechanism glowed green. Occupied. I-5 pinged Yemon, who popped the hatch. Yemon was alone in the pod. No Loranth. He tried his comlink. She didn't answer, which might mean nothing, or it might mean... A slow, creeping dread enveloped him. If he could only reach out, just a tendril of thought... The merest thread. He closed his eyes, extended his feelings. Jax! I-5 put a metal hand on his shoulder, just firmly enough to arrest his attempt to reach Loranth. What now? Do we wait or split up? Din was about amidships, nearing the intersection with the transverse passageway, when two things happened almost simultaneously. The emergency lights began to flicker on and off, and he stepped into a sudden pall of acrid smoke. He stopped, heart pounding, and peered into billowing clouds luridly lit 
by golden light and flickers of brighter incandescence from some point roughly at the center of the transverse passageway. He choked, less on the smoke and more on the sudden realization of where it must come from, the dorsal weapons bay. He put himself in motion again, forcing himself to move through the smoke and intermittent light. He could hear the pop and hiss of fried circuitry, the ticking of cooling metal. Please, Triac, let her have gotten out. Merciful Warren, mother of all solace, I beg you. He hurried toward the confluence of the transverse and fore and aft passageways. As he'd feared, the source of the smoke was the weapons battery. It was also the source of a string of what could have been either curses or prayers delivered in a husky female voice. The litany ended with, That's it. Come on. Come on. Come on. Lorenth. Din reached the spot below the battery and peered up. The retractable ladder was halfway down, but Lorenth was still up in the bay, working over a control panel that looked as if it had imploded. Her face was crisscrossed with cuts. Her bare shoulders and leku bled from numerous wounds. What are you doing? he demanded. Get out of there. Not yet. Not until I send Lord Vader one last message. She was reaching for the firing mechanism, or what was left of it. Peering through the transparasteel cowl over her head, Din realized what she meant to do. The dorsal turbo laser was aimed right into the belly of Vader's ship at point blank range. Lorenth, no! But she was already committed. The emergency lights brightened and power surged. She fired. The backlash was so intense it swept Din off his feet and tossed him down the fore and aft passage as if he were a leaf in the wind. In the flutter of amber from the emergency lights, Jack surveyed the life pods. There was one to either side of an access tube that ran from where they stood to the cargo deck and up to a scanner array. He considered sending I-5 and Yemon off to the port pod, but if they split up, it would severely complicate their escape plans. He'd opened his mouth to tell I-5 to join Yemon in the pod when an explosion lit up the fore and aft passageway. The ship bucked fiercely, throwing Jax to the deck. Rising, he felt sudden cold. It was as if someone had siphoned the freezing void of space into his soul. He scrambled to his feet, peering forward along the fore and aft corridor. An acrid odor reached him, breathed out by the ship's sputtering emergency life support system. Through the flickering light, Jax realized his view of the forward section of the ship was obscured by smoke. No! Jax ran, vaguely hearing I-5 call his name. The ship felt wrong beneath Din's booted feet as he dragged himself upright in the choking swirling of smoke. It was bobbing like a cork, which made no sense. The agrav field was either on or off. If it was on, the boson field generated mass instability. If it was off, he staggered back to the weapons battery and was scared witless when a large, solid figure flew out of the gloom, nearly knocking him down again. It took him a moment to realize that it was Jax. The Jedi reached up into the battery and hauled on the half-deployed ladder. The warped scrap of metal fought his attempt to pull it down fully. Din heaved himself upward. He was just able to grasp the bottommost rung of the ladder and add his weight to it. He heard the sharp, guttural rasp of labored breathing, but had no idea if it was Lorant's or Jax's or his own. He choked on the acrid vapors, blinked as dying circuitry spat sparks at him. The ladder jerked downward, and Lorant fell from the battery into Jax's arms. Her bones shattered, her life force flickering like the emergency lights that lit her ravaged face. Her left leku was nearly severed, and a piece of shrapnel had pierced her neck just below her jawline, nearly severing the cortical artery. Din could only cling to the ladder and watch. He pulled his gaze from Lorant's face to Jax's. That was far worse. He had to look away. He turned his eyes aft, and his breath stopped in his throat. I-5 had started toward them from the stern. Yaman had left the safety of the life pod. Behind them, just climbing out of the stairwell. Jax! Din's voice was a raw whisper. 
He looked back at Jax and Laranth, and caught the moment in which Laranth breathed something into Jax's ear, and then gave her soul back to the Force. It felt as if the entire universe paused to observe the moment before moving forward again. Jax didn't need to be told what Din had seen in the aft passageway. Din could see that he knew. The knowledge was written in the sudden stiffening of his body, in the hard remoteness of his eyes, as he laid Lorant's broken shell gently on the deck and rose. His lightsaber hummed to life, lighting the dim corridor with blue-green ambience. Jax stepped aft, the smoke eddying around him. Din watched, helpless, as the Jedi approached I-5 and Yaman. The whiplash leader and his droid protector were blocked from escape by a towering black figure flanked by a quartet of stormtroopers. Darth Vader drew his lightsaber as well and took one long step toward Jax and his companions. His weapon thrummed to life, its blood-red radiance spilling up the bulkheads. The ship shifted again, the agrav field flickering like the lights. One of the stormtroopers hastened to Vader's side and spoke to him, gesturing upward, his voice too low to hear. In answer, Vader made a sharp motion with one hand, and the stormtroopers turned as one, leveling their weapons at Jax. You're dead, comrade, said Vader, his dark voice betraying no emotion. Disabled our stasis field, an act for which she has paid with her life. The ship is adrift into the matter stream between the stars, so you will forfeit that as well. I have but one more thing to take from you. My life? Jax asked, his voice harsh and raw. No, that would be too easy, wouldn't it? The stormtrooper nearest him turned his helmeted head. But Lord Vader, the Emperor's orders. Vader raised a gloved hand, fisted, and the stormtrooper fell silent. I am well aware of the Emperor's orders. I execute them in my own fashion. What I take from you, Jax Pavan, is the very thing you have been so jealously guarding these many months. He turned his masked face toward Yaman. The Syrian's eyes rolled back in his head, and he slumped against the bulkhead behind him. Vader reached out with his free hand and made a grasping motion that arrested Yaman's slide. Two of the stormtroopers moved quickly to grab his arms and lift him up. Jax and I-5 leapt in unison, Jax's lightsaber spinning. The stormtroopers fired, and a burst of hard, particulate light flooded the passageway. Din had no time to cover his eyes. He was blinded utterly. When he was able to see again, Jax stood in the center of the passageway, his lightsaber raised defensively. The corridor was littered with debris. Vader and his troopers were gone, and with them, Thizon Yaman. The ship was dead in space, drifting toward oblivion. Lorant's body lay broken on the deck, and I-5. Din tried to move and nearly tripped over something at his feet. He looked down. I-5's head, battered and blackened, lay on the decking before him. 4. They had to leave now, or they never would. He knew that Lorant's body was just an empty shell. He knew that. He was, after all, a Jedi. Death was no stranger to him. And yet, he wanted to linger within one broken vessel, cradling the other in his arms. Or barring that, to take Lorant's body with him into a life pod. He shut the urges down. There is no death. There is the Force. Her last words. He looked around for Din. The Celestin was still alive, quivering against the bulkhead with I-5's head in his arms. Jax had to get Din off Far Ranger. And to do so, he had to leave Loranth behind. He forced himself to move. He deactivated his lightsaber and put a hand on the Celestin's shoulder. Get to the life pod, the one to starboard. Din looked up at him through haunted eyes. Jax saw his own reflection in them. Not, not without you. Wait for me. 
Give me a minute, that's all I need. If I'm not there in a minute, take off. He sprinted for his cabin then, their cabin, trusting that Din wouldn't try to follow him. It took him only seconds to dart in and get the Misai tree, all of Laurent that was left to him. He spent another second considering the idea of not joining Din in the life pod. He shook his head. Stupid. He was being stupid and tragic. This was not the time to make life decisions. Carrying the tree, he raced aft again, pausing only to sweep up one of Laurent's blasters, the only one still in one piece, and to touch her ruined face. Her flesh was cold. Her house was empty. The ship shuddered again, reminding him that he had limited time. Not that he expected Din to leave him behind. Not really. He reached the life pod and swung inside, sealing the door behind him. Din was sitting in the co-pilot seat, working on I-5's head, reconnecting a few of the myriad wires that straggled from the droid's neck. Jax thought he saw the droid's optics flicker briefly, but the effect was too ephemeral for him to be sure. He slid into the pilot's seat, not that he'd be doing much piloting, strapped in and hit the launch mechanism. Seconds later, they were flying through the twins' tidal bore. It took long, agonizing moments to win clear of the star's gravity, but they did at last. In the relative silence of the capsule... Jack swiveled his head to look at Din. The Sullustan stared back, I-5's head pressed between his hands. His gaze was on the tree in Jax's lap. She, um, she gave you that? Din asked. Din's voice was soft. Jax barely heard him. He nodded. Stupid, I suppose, but... No, not stupid. Not at all. You waited more than a minute. You took more than a minute. I ordered you to go. He ordered me to stay. Din hefted the droid's head. Din. I did order him to stay, said I-5 succinctly. His optics flickered, unmistakably this time. I've lost enough today as it is. We all have. Losing you, not in my plans. Jax felt as if his bones were melting. His hands shook. He grasped the arms of the pilot's chair to stop them, grasped them until his knuckles turned white. Choice is loss. Indecision is all loss, he murmured. I choose Yaman, I lose Laranth. I choose Laranth, I lose Yaman. I hesitate, I lose both, and the ship, and you. Except that I'm still here, I-5 said emphatically. Though, admittedly, I've lost a bit of weight. After a pause, the droid added, In some sense, Laurent is still here as well. Remember your training, Jax. There is no death. There is the Force. Jax stared out the viewport at the void of space, aware that behind them, the far ranger with her lonely cargo was diving into the star stuff, returning to the primal forge. It was easier to meditate on those words than understand what they meant. He'd lost his mentor and understood them, he thought. He'd lost Nick Rostu and thought he'd understood them. But this, losing the woman who'd been his most intimate companion, the person who completed his sentences, this was not like those losses. He felt as if a piece of his own soul had been ripped away. The piece that gave it light. He wanted desperately to reach out through the Force and feel her there, to make certain the Jedi mantra was truth. He told himself he did not, only because it would betray his continued existence to Vader. But Vader knew. He had taken the whiplash leader, almost casually blasted I-5 to bits when the droid had tried to stop him, and just as casually caused Jax's muscles to lock in titanic spasm. Then he had turned and left with his troops. A loud ping sounded in the silence. A light flashed in his eyes. He looked through the tiny porthole, saw a ship hovering perhaps half a click away. 
It was their ranger escort, come to rescue them. Or what was left, he thought. Two broken men and a broken droid. Five. The rangers, small, stealthy vessels, which they called darts, scooped up the life pod carrying Jax and his companions at the fringes of the twins' gravity well, docked with it, transferred them to Aaron Foley's ship, and carried them back to Toprawa. Jax spent the entire journey in a state of mental lockdown. After that last explosion of anguish, he was a pit, a hole, a yawning gravity well into which light fell without effect. He watched the mouth of the abyss from a high, detached point within his mind. The invisible seethe of emotions at the bottom could not be allowed to rise to the surface or to leak out. Vader would believe him dead, broken into free ions by the twins' plasmatic inferno, and he feared that even a whimper in the darkness of his soul would expose him. He felt Din's gaze on him, and Aaron Foley's when she turned from the ship's helm. He could even feel I-5's regard. He still hadn't gotten used to that. He relaxed his guard a bit when they reached Toprawa, even noticed when the ship dived straight at a rocky cliff and, at the point of impact, simply slipped through the holographic disguise and into a great, hollow cavern that was not entirely natural. There were over half a dozen ships of various sizes ahead on the cavern floor. Overhead, the roof of the mountain disappeared into darkness punctuated by pale yellow lights. They twinkled in the midst of a waterfall that plunged like a ribbon of crystal from an unseen source down hundreds of feet to the cavern floor. Jax followed its silver path with his eyes. The group of ships ahead were on an island in the middle of a small lake. This is amazing, said Den quietly. Then to Jax, when you said they had an underground, I didn't think you meant it literally. Welcome to Mountain Home, Aaron told them. She guided her dart expertly to the island and sat down in the lee of a large vessel that Jax recognized as a Helix-class interceptor. The small, armed freighters had been outlawed by the Empire because of their speed, maneuverability, and firepower. The first ships off the Arachid assembly line had barely reached their new owners when the Emperor had commanded them to either strip the vessels down or get rid of them. Most had obeyed. Apparently, some hadn't. This interceptor was fully armed and seemed to be undergoing repair. As Aaron Foley settled the dart to the sand, Jax emerged from dormancy enough to examine the other ships nearby. He recognized several. A Kuat Systems cloak-shaped fighter that was in the process of being fitted with new missile launchers, a Cutlass patrol fighter, and a third ship that couldn't be what it appeared to be. Jax took a deep breath. Is that a Delta-7? Aaron shut down the engines. It is. Wanna look? Want? That was an alien idea. He nodded anyway. They disembarked, Jax still carrying the Misai tree, Din carrying I-5's head, and the ranger led them over to the sleek, wedge-shaped vessel. It was damaged, so badly scorched that the original color of the ship was almost obliterated. It had been red, which meant it had belonged to a specific Jedi. The Delta Sevens, officially the Aether Sprite series, had been used by the Jedi so extensively most people had simply called them Jedi Starfighters. Jax had never had the opportunity to pilot one. He moved around it, beneath its sharply pointed bow, feeling as if he'd entered a shrine. He put a hand up to touch the port wing, noticing as he did that the droid socket was empty. Whose was it? Do you know? He asked the silent ranger behind him. He could feel her gaze on him as he moved aft under the wing. No, when it was found, it was drifting empty. The astromech was gone. Jax turned to look at her. At Geonosis? 
after, but it had drifted so far out into space, no one has any idea how or even when it got there. The NAVCOM has been wiped clean. Jax touched the vessel again, trying to glean from it any sort of energy signature he might recognize. Something that might suggest to him which of his fellow Jedi might have piloted the vessel. There was nothing identifiable, only a diffuse imprint. He took his hand away, wiped his palm on his tunic. Aaron stepped over to him and laid a hand on his arm. We should go. You'll want to contact your people on Dantooine and Coruscant. He pulled away from the Jedi vessel. Where are we going? Foothill. That's where our headquarters is. Foothill, Mountain Home. Code names? asked Din, who trailed them at a short distance. More like generic descriptors. There's a network of subterranean passages that run under the spaceport and right up to the edge of town. We give them street names. It makes you seem a bit less shadowy when you can walk and talk openly in daylight about your big super-secret underground township. People just think you're talking about locations in Big Wooly. I-5 made a clicking sound. Township? Aaron looked at the droid remnant and smiled, as if talking to bodiless machine was something she did every day. You'll see. She turned and led them toward where the waterfall met the cavern lake, sending up plumes of mist. How was all this made? Din asked. Aaron shook her head. The big vault... We honestly don't know. It was something we stumbled across at the beginning of the war. Most of the townward part we carved out of rock and soil. She led them past work crews and pilots, who watched and sometimes waved. They crossed a wooden bridge that seemed to end at a ragged pile of boulders. Beyond those, screened from the cavern itself, was a pathway that ran around the perimeter of the cave on the outer shore of the lake. Aaron turned left and led them right up to the waterfall. The pathway ran behind it and into a tunnel wide enough for the three of them to walk abreast. Perhaps calling the ranger outpost a township was too grand, but it was more than a mere bunker. There were branching corridors, storage rooms, living quarters, a dispensary infirmary, a meditation chapel, and a small cantina of the type you might find aboard a space station. The place was populated, if sparsely, with sentience from a number of worlds, though most seemed to be human. All found Jax and his companions of interest. All clearly knew Aaron Foley well. Where are you taking us? Jax asked as they reached an intersection with a second tunnel. That depends on you, Aaron said. On how you feel. I can take you to quarters. You could rest, sleep for a while. No, said Jax more sharply than he meant to. I don't want to sleep. Eat then? When Jax didn't answer, Din said, I don't think either of us is hungry right now. What's option number three? I could take you to Deegan. Deegan, I-5 repeated. Deegan Core. He and I share leadership here. I represent the Rangers. He represents other interested groups. Are you, that is, do you want to meet him now? I could at least show you to some quarters so you have a place to put your, your tree? Her voice lifted questioningly. Jax glanced down at the Misai, the only thing in his possession he needed a place for, besides the clothing he wore. He now had exactly four other belongings. Two lightsabers, the Sith blade an anonymous someone had given him, and the new one he and Loranth had made. The Pyronium that Anakin had given him long ago for safekeeping, and the Sith holocron his father had bequeathed to him. These he carried on his person. I'll keep it, thanks. She nodded, though she radiated bemusement. I'll keep this too, thanks, said Din, lifting I-5's head. The wide corners of his mouth turned up in a smile, but the expression didn't reach his eyes. Jax realized suddenly that he wasn't alone in his grief. How could he have felt that he was? He turned to Aaron Foley. We'll need a droid tech if you can spare one, 
to help us with I-5. She gave the droid's head a long look. I thought that looked like an I-5YQ unit. It seems unusually curious. Long story, Jax told her, but Five is more than just a droid. He's been my companion and friend for... He found himself unable to finish the sentence. I understand, said Aaron, though she couldn't possibly have understood the relationship between man and machine. Jax knew she understood grief and loss. She had no doubt experienced it herself in recent years, given that the Empire took his dim view of the Rangers as they did of the Jedi, and had tried to wipe them out as well. Follow me. She turned left into the intersecting tunnel, which was even wider than the first and better lit. The floor underfoot was a polished pale gray stone with streaks of green. It so happens that Deacon Kor is a mechanical genius, Foley went on. He's retrofitted most of the systems on the vessels that have come through Mountain Home. He's not an expert on service and human adjunct droids like your YQ unit, but he knows a lot about artificial intelligence in general. He runs a vessel and vehicle repair facility up top. She glanced up at the rocky roof overhead has a reputation as a go-to guy for broken hyperdrives. I don't know if we have any parts lying around for an I-5, but I'm sure he can do something to help you out. Deegan Kaur was a tall, lanky man in his prime with dark eyes of indeterminate color and hair so black it seemed to absorb light. He wore a Mechtex coverall beneath a long vest of many pockets whose contents were a mystery. Din would not have pegged him for a resistance leader in a million years, which was probably part of what made him an effective resistance leader. He had no parts for an I-5YQ lying around, but he did offer Din access to his workshops and an assistant of sorts to help patch together a body for the shattered droid. Din was grateful for anything he could get. Repairing I-5 dominated his thoughts, and he let it. It was vastly better than what strove to push his constructive agenda aside. There was an image in the back of his mind, a dark passageway clogged with smoke and fitful light. A twisted ladder. A broken body. Din shook himself and tried to focus on what the Toprawan resistance leader was saying. Something about their loss. Yes, their loss. Jax's loss. Whiplash's loss. Ben was overwhelmed for a moment by the sheer magnitude of it. Loranth gone. Yaman taken. The ship gone. And five. He gripped the droid's head more tightly and realized he was shaking. Do you mind? A scratchy voice said from beneath his arm. You're covering my audio inputs. Ben laughed reflexively and set I-5's head on the low table in front of the hassock on which he sat. He didn't take his hands off it, though. He had a horrible feeling he'd collapse if he did that. Glancing at Jax, he wondered if Jax didn't feel the same way about the little tree that sat between his booted feet and that he caressed with his fingertips. Deegan Kaur handed Jax, then Din, a cup of steaming amber liquid. Aaron Foley served herself from the carafe on the table as her co-leader folded himself into a chair diagonally to Jax and across from Din. It's Shig. Deegan nodded at the cups. We grow the Bahat for it locally. I find it bracing. Figured you might need bracing after what you've been through. What we've been through. Din found himself back in the smoky passageway again. He dragged himself out. He figured he'd be doing this for a while and he also had the feeling it wasn't going to get any easier as time went on. Thanks, Jack said, and sipped the beverage. Ben sniffed at his. Citrusy? He sipped it, feeling it burn its way down to his empty belly. It really did feel bracing. He closed his eyes. It was dark behind his eyes. Dark in the passageway. He opened his eyes and inhaled again the perfume of the shig. How long would it be before he could close his eyes and not go back to the Far Ranger's last moments? Lorant's last moments. Deegan Kaur was watching Jax soberly. 
I took the liberty of alerting your people on Dantooine that something had happened, and there had been a problem. I thought maybe I should let you tell them the details, unless you'd rather I... No. Jack shook his head. No, I need to do that. And I'll need to get through to the whiplash on Coruscant, too. And tell them what? Ben wondered. Of course, said Deegan. What did happen? How did Vader know where you'd be? I don't know. I wish I did. I hate to think it was simply that he's now able to sense me. Simply, repeated Aaron, and Deegan's dark eyes widened. At our last encounter, he ingested a powerful biotic agent that, I think it opened the floodgates on his force perception and overwhelmed him, initially anyway. Like trying to put that waterfall out there through a small tube, or passing all the power from a hyperdrive through a single bus. There's no way to be sure what effect that may have had on his force sense, although I wouldn't have bet that it would have become more sensitive as a result. Deegan was nodding. Right. Usually, if you overload a sense, it's deadened for at least a while after. Although, it can also become hypersensitive, or even both in turns. It's equally likely there's a mole in your organization. He grinned mirthlessly. Not sure which is worse, a hypersensitive Sith or a spy. I'll take the spy, I-5 said. I think we may have a chance of discovering who that is. The two Tuprawans blinked at him in surprise. It almost had to be someone in the room when we made the plans to go to Dantooine, I-5 continued. His voice was thin and reedy, without the resonating chamber of his torso afforded. Or someone in the Far Rangers' prep crew. Jax shook his head. Could have been someone at Westport Control. We did file an itinerary. Yes, but the twins weren't on it. Only Whiplash operatives knew at what point we were going to depart from the itinerary. As did a handful of people here. Jax glanced up at Deegan Kaur, who shrugged. The droid is right, Jax, and that's something we'll have to consider. He exchanged glances with Aaron Foley. What will you do now? Aaron asked. Go on to Dantooine? No reason. We'll go back to Coruscant, regroup, Figure out how we can get Yemon back. Deegan and Aaron exchanged glances again. Then the lanky mech tech leaned forward in his chair, elbows on his knees. You could work out of Toprawa, Jax. You're not only welcome here, you're needed. This is where the battle will be won. Out here, where the Empire has to spread itself thin. A number of squadrons out here are for show. They don't do anything but maintain a strategic presence. Unnerve the locals. We let them think they're doing that while we build a fleet right under their noses. You could be part of that. Command your own wing of fighters. Din held his breath, watching Jax's expressionless face intently. Why me in particular? Jax asked finally. Aaron and I both know you're Jedi, though no one else here does, or at least they're not supposed to. Your talents could be very useful out here, and you could have a ship, any ship you wanted, even that old Jedi starfighter. More than that, though, there are pockets of resistance to the Empire that are working independently. Sometimes we get in each other's way. Sometimes we end up working at cross-purposes. One group of rebels wants to go for blood. Another wants to play the waiting game. With you and the Vanguard, I'm convinced we could bring all of them together under one mandate. Get them working in concert with us instead of at odds. You could unify this effort, Jax. They'd rally behind a Jedi. You'd be a miracle to them, because right now they think the whole Order's dead. Jax's face grew even paler. He reached down and brushed the boughs of the tree with the tips of his fingers. He shook his head. I have to find Yimon and free him. Understood, but... Vader could have killed him, but he didn't. Jax's gaze moved from Aaron to Deegan. After months of trying to assassinate him, striking blindly, wildly, 
Suddenly, they spring a well-set trap and capture him. Yaman said something before we left Coruscant that I should have listened to. He said it felt as if we were being herded, encouraged to do just what we did, leave Coruscant. I don't suppose it matters at this point whether the whole thing was a plot or whether they just got lucky at the end. The result was that they have the one man whose knowledge about Whiplash could completely destroy it. If we don't get Yemon away from Vader before he gets that information, Whiplash is dead, and any parts of the Resistance Yemon has knowledge of as well. Deegan Kor shook his head. Jax, what makes you think Vader doesn't already have that information? Din found it suddenly hard to breathe. In all the craziness, he hadn't even considered that. From the grim expressions on Aaron Foley's and Deegan Kor's faces, he could see that they had. Thaizan Yaman is the undisputed leader of Whiplash, Jack said doggedly. He was leader of Whiplash from the beginning and had at least one Jedi Master who was content to be one of his operatives. There was a reason for that. Yaman has more mental discipline than some Jedi I knew. He's exceptional, even for a Syrian. And none of us, except maybe Loranth, he stopped, licked his lips. I'm not sure even Loranth knew how sensitive he was to the Force. Still. And there's something else, Jack said. On the ship, when Vader reached out to control him, Yaman seemed to lose consciousness. Or rather, to give it up. To me... It felt as if he disappeared or, or shut off before Vader could control him. For a moment, I thought Vader had done it, but it seemed to surprise him. He had to react quickly to keep Yemon from collapsing. If Yemon has some way of suppressing his consciousness or denying Vader access to it, he may at least be able to buy some time. But I have no way of knowing how long he can hold out. What do you intend to do? Deegan asked. First, we've got to warn Whiplash. Tudin Sal needs to know what's happened, because chances are he's going to have to dismantle and rebuild the entire network, and that's going to take time. Time he may not have. Then we need to find Yimon. The Resistance leader nodded. We can give you a secure relay to your contacts on Coruscant. But what if you can't find Yimon? I can't think that way, Jax told him. I have to believe that I can find him, that I will find him, and soon. You said I could have a ship. I'm going to need one to get back to Coruscant. Unless we find out otherwise, I have to assume that's where Vader will take Yemon. Deegan nodded. How close is that old interceptor to being repaired? A couple of days. Can I... Of course, said Aaron, with one stipulation that you'll seriously consider coming back to Toprawa and joining the Rangers, whatever happens with Thaizan Yaman. Din took a deep breath in unison with Jax. The Jedi nodded. I'll consider it. Seriously. Right now, I need to use your hypercom to see if I can get a message to Whiplash. 6. He had to eat. He did it without half-tasting what he put in his mouth. He drank copious amounts of the hot shig because it fooled him into thinking his mind was alert and working properly. He had to sleep, too, though he put it off for as long as he could. When he noticed that Din was doing the same thing, he opened his mouth to lecture, then closed it. Who was he to talk? The tired mind wanders. If there is an unpleasant place to go, it will go there. Right now, his was wandering down an avenue of thought that was all too disturbing. He had sent a terse, encrypted message to Tudensal on Coruscant. But as yet, there had been no reply. Jax didn't know whether Sal had gotten it or not, or even if he was alive to get it. Conjecture was futile. Jax decided to try meditation as an antidote. In the small but cozy quarters Aaron had given him next to Din's, he sat before the Misai tree, following its feathery boughs as if he were navigating a city canyon on Coruscant. 
following the flow of the force. There is no emotion. There is peace. He'd thought exhaustion would be a form of peace. But Jax now realized the folly in eschewing sleep for the past thirty hours. He needed his mind to be clear and steady. If he was going to find Yemon, he needed every faculty and power he possessed at his command. Faculties that were presently shutting down. There is no ignorance. There is knowledge. He not only needed knowledge, he needed to be able to marshal it, recall it, use it. He was far from that. Far from even knowing where to begin his quest for Yemon. There is no passion. There is serenity. But he wasn't serene. Passion roiled just below the surface. Passion that had no practical outlet. What he wanted. To go back in time. To rewrite the last two days. He could not do. He tried to haul the burst of energy under control. To redirect it back to the path to the tree. But his mind rebelled, urging him to do when there was no clear thing to be done. There is no chaos. There is harmony. There was nothing but chaos. Nothing. Jax Pavan, Jedi, was empty of anything but disorder and turmoil. There is no death. There is the Force. As a Jedi, he had been taught that, at death, an individual became one with the Force. If that were true, might he not be able to feel Loranth through the Force in some small way? Again, he felt the urge to reach out in the hope that Loranth would reach back. He repressed the convulsion, fought it down. He could no longer pretend that Darth Vader was the reason for his reluctance. He felt the tears on his cheeks, warm and wet, just before the sobs racked him. The assistant that Deegan Kor gave Din was a kid, a Rodian kid, an orphan, which meant that as much as Din felt like refusing the offer, he didn't. Really, how do you say no to an orphan? The kid had a droid he'd built himself. He called it candy because it was a sweet tin can. It had once been an old P2 unit, but bore little resemblance to one now. The kid, his name was Jerry, had replaced the P2's turret with the head of an RX series pilot droid. Din thought Bug Eyes was a far better name for the thing than candy. But he wasn't about to say anything out loud. He hardly had room to comment about the size of anyone else's eyeballs. Besides, it might hurt the Rodian boy's feelings. The assistant wasn't exactly impressive at first glance. The workshop he ushered Din into surely was. It was 30 meters long and roughly half as wide. The equipment and tools though clearly scavenged from a variety of sources, were mostly state-of-the-art, with a lot of upgrades and modifications, some of which would have been mind-boggling even if Din hadn't been nursing a sleep deprivation headache that was unimpressed with the four hours of shut-eye he'd managed to get over the past two days. The droid diagnostic station was extraordinary. It had not one, but three artificial intelligence modules daisy-chained together in such a way that the operator could assess and repair a droid's neural pathways in less than half the time it would take with one. That's amazing, said Din. Deegan put that together? No, I did, Jerry said. There was no boastfulness in that simple admission. The kid grinned in that queerly way Rodian's grin, the corners of his mouth turning up as the tip of his protuberant muzzle turned down. Deegan says I have a knack for machines. Hero worship. As Din recalled from somewhere in his misty past, it felt good to have heroes. Then we've come to the right place, said I-5 under Din's arm. The Sullustan jumped. 
He'd forgotten the droid was there. Jerry's grin curled farther up at the corners. Got that right. Wait till you see the inventory. He crossed to a pair of metal doors at one end of the workshop and pushed them open, then beckoned to Din. The kid was right. The inventory was incredible. Droids and bots and parts thereof lined the walls of a room not much smaller than the workshop itself. Din had expected a mad jumble, but the parts were arranged neatly, if randomly. Heads and turrets, shreds, legs, and arms were wrapped in a celebration of orderliness. But, okay, I can see you've got a system, Din said. But I don't quite... They're in Rodian alphabetical order, Five said testily. May we get on with finding me an appropriate vehicle? Yeah, Din said. He asked Jerry, Got anything in an I-5YQ? Proboscis wrinkling and head swiveling, Jerry surveyed his inventory. We don't get much call for protocol droids here. Mostly I repair tech bots. I have a 9T and a couple of 5Ys. He pointed at a peculiar, stumpy-legged droid with long, slender arms and no exoskeleton. I look like a garbage snipe. Don't you have anything more closely approximating my original body? I have part of an LEBO2D9, but only the torso, arms, and head. Mostly, we've got arms and cortices. Those are the parts we use most. Do you have the rest of that RX unit you used for your little friend there? Candy, who'd been sitting quietly in the doorway behind them, let out a bleep of outrage at the adjective. Pardon, said I-5. I meant no disrespect. Candy accepted the apology with a single chirp. Jerry was shaking his head. Sorry, the head was all we salvaged. I can empathize, I-5 told the RXP2 hybrid. It uttered a muted trill. What are your top three desired features? Jerry asked, sounding like a used droid salesman. Strength, maneuverability, and modifiability. Jerry considered this, then began prowling through the neat racks of bots and parks, muttering to himself. Din, bored and bone-tired, glanced around the workshop. He found his gaze returning again and again to a shadowy corner of the room in which he could just make out someone standing and staring at him. Uh, Jerry, who's that? The boy looked up and followed his gaze into the shadows. He laughed. That's not a who. That's a what. It's a BB-4000. A what? Let me see it, said I-5. Din picked up the droid's head and carried it back into the corner. Gazing at what stood there, Din frowned. It looked like a man in close-fitting dark blue coveralls. But it wasn't a man. It wasn't moving. Not a muscle. Not a breath. Not an eye flutter beneath the closed lids. It was weird. He realized belatedly that it was standing in an open crate. A neatly printed label along one side read, BB-4000. This is a droid? Jerry didn't bother to look up from his rummaging. It's a body bot, an HRD, human replicant droid. How? asked I-5. In the seven hells of frolics did you manage to get one of these? We've got two. You've heard of Leisure Mech? Even I've heard of Leisure Mech, said Din. They risked everything on the success of their human replicant series. Customers didn't take to them, and Leisure Mech went under. Yeah, well, when they went under, they sold off all their remaining stock. Deegan got ours for a song. I think they're pretty cool, even with... You know, that whole weirdness about him being too human to feel like a droid and too inhuman to seem like a real person. He is indeed pretty cool, said I-5. Is he functional? Nah, one of the reasons Deegan got them so cheap was the lack of working processor units. They're wired for brains. 
All the relays are in place to the frame and musculature. But there's nothing in there. Interesting, I-5 said in a tone of voice that Din found far too thoughtful. Five, you don't want one. They melt. Do you remember? Caird told us he'd seen one melt. Din shuddered at the memory. In the factory district, just before we, well, you actually, blew the place up real good. Good times, I-5 said softly. Then he continued. Anyway, those were 3000 series droids. This is the next generation. A different design than the previous models. They gave up on genomic algorithmic programming and cloning organs from synth flesh and concentrated on neural net parallel processing, which greatly increased neural interaction and downgraded the development of killer memes. The downside was that it took longer and cost more. But no disgusting puddles to get out of the carpet, Jerry finished. Except it wasn't the melting that killed Leisure Mac. It was the ECD. Den shook his head. The what? Eerie Cowley Disorder, said I-5. It refers to a pronounced sense of unease experienced by most humans and humanoids when they encounter a droid that appears almost, but not quite, human. Most humanoids are genetically programmed toward periidolia, which is the ability to extrapolate complex images or sounds from simple stimuli. Seeing a face in the clouds, for example. The Witch Nebula is a classic interpolation of... He'll go on like this for hours if you let him, Din remarked. It's kind of interesting, Jerry said. But, he continued, addressing the droid, what's your point? My point is the problem is easy to fix. It's a simple matter of shade shifting in subtle skin tones. The droid looks weird to sentience because his skin is too uniform a shade. Jerry stared at him. Huh. You know, that makes a lot of sense. Too bad you weren't working for LM back then. Wonder why none of their engineers ever thought of it. Probably, said I-5, because they never asked a droid. May I remind you, said Din, that your master power switch is still operational, and ever so easier for me to reach. The droid uttered a mechanical snort, then asked Jerry, Did you find anything useful? What? Oh, yeah, how about this? He lifted something out onto the floor. It was a ridiculously compact collection of metal rods and joints, surmounted by what looked like a shallow soup kettle or an ATAT -AT pilot's helmet. It barely came up to Din's kneecaps. Uh, said Din, isn't that a little small? Oh, sorry, here. Jerry tapped the bot on the top of its metal head, and it unfolded itself, popping up to become recognizable as a diminutive but immensely strong D.U.M. pit droid. Not much over a meter in height, the D.U.M.s were used to repair air cars and pod racers, which Din suspected must be vanishingly rare on this densely forested part of Toprawa. How'd that get here? Din asked. One of the rangers used to be a champion pod racer down south. It's a lot drier and desert -y er there, Jerry said. Anyway, she was a race driver until she wiped out about two years ago. Lost an eye. She's got an implant now, of course, but she gave up racing. This little guy, he indicated the pit droid, got his neural net scragged in the same accident. One of the drivers came into the pit too hot. So, I-5 said, it has no brain. Yeah, just the basic reflexes. I can fold him up and unfold him, order him to walk around, but that's about it. Strong, maneuverable, and modifiable, mused I-5, and great manual dexterity, a plus if I'm going to self-modify. I'd say it will do fine. Will my cortex fit under the helm? Jerry considered this. With some modifications, of course. I could just mount your head on the chassis. Den stifled a chuckle. That would be interesting. Yes, I-5 agreed. It would. And I don't want to be interesting. I want to be invisible. Where we're going, invisibility is a definite asset. Well, great. 
Jerry enthused, rubbing his hands together. Ready for our little science experiment? Den took a deep breath. Look, Five, this is great for now, but, but you don't want to, you know, stay that way, right? He inclined his head toward the little pit droid. Eventually, I should like to find my way back into a YQ chassis or something equivalent. But for now, this will do. Although, I'd also like to take some spare parts, Jerry, if you don't mind. Jerry's muzzle contorted into a grin. Freezing, he said. Let's do it. I'm surprised you didn't consider the Jedi Starfighter, said Deegan. His voice was muffled and tinny due to the fact that he was lying inside the Interceptor's ion exhaust manifold, aligning the baffles. Too small, said Jax automatically. It's made to hold only a pilot and a droid. I could mod it for you. We could make room for your little Celestin friend. This came from the engineer assisting Deegan with the refit. Her name was Sasha Swiftbird. Swiftbird had been her alias during her pod racing days and she'd kept it even after coming to the Rangers. That puzzled Jax. She couldn't have been much older than he was, and had been forced into early retirement by a horrific accident, which she hinted had been no accident at all, but the vicious revenge of a losing driver during a race. It had left her with a cybernetic implant where her left eye had been, and a silvery filament of scarring across her upper and lower eyelids. Right now, both were covered by a thick lock of black hair. It was hard to understand why she'd want to keep the name that went with that dead life. Jax didn't ask why. In fact, he found it hard to meet her pale gray gaze. Her scars reminded him of Lorance. The gray paladin, too, had been left with scar tissue, her personal souvenirs of Order 66 and Flame Knight. Jax shook his head his gaze on the drive manifold. I'm not really ready to advertise to the galaxy that I'm Jedi. And I don't need fighting capability. What I need is stealth with speed and muscle. This is perfect. He could feel the woman's regard for a moment more, before she shrugged and knelt to rummage in her toolkit. Your call. But if I were you, I'd jump at the chance to fly that baby. You're not me, Jax murmured regretting the words the moment they left his mouth. Fortunately, Swiftbird didn't seem to hear him, or if she did, she chose to ignore the jibe. Well, this may not be as sleek and piratical as the Starfighter, Deegan said, pulling himself out of the Interceptor's manifold, but it'll hold your crew with some room to spare, that's for sure, and cargo as well, if you need it. Yeah, added Sasha, and it'll surprise the pants off anybody who mistakes it for a stock freighter. That it would, Jax suspected. Are you sure you don't need the ship more than we do? Jax asked for the tenth time. Deegan paused in the act of wiping his hands on a towel, glanced at Sasha, then gave Jax a look that neatly penetrated tissue and bone and drilled straight into his soul. We're all we, Jax. We're all whiplash. Whatever we choose to call ourselves, rangers, resistance, freedom fighters, it doesn't really matter. We're all on the same side. If you need the ship, you get the ship. Jax smiled his thanks, wishing that the expression were more than just a physical tugging of his lips. What are you going to call her? Sasha asked. Loranth. The name leapt to Jax's mind so quickly, he almost spoke it aloud. I hadn't really thought. I suppose I'll let Din pick something. Loranth, Din said the name immediately when Jax asked him later that day. He stood with Jax, Deegan, and Sasha on the landing pad beneath the soaring vault of Mountain Home, looking up at the Interceptor. Seeing the sudden shuddering in Jax's face, the cold remoteness of his eyes, he winced. I... I mean, it seems like we ought to do something... Jax cut off a flare of sudden anger. At what or whom, he was uncertain. Maybe he was angry at the universe, or at the gods, or at the Force for abandoning them, for abandoning her, for putting Yimon in the hands of Darth Vader and the Emperor. Din started again. I want to remember her, Jax. I want to honor her. I want... 
You want her to still be here. So do I. But she's not. Jax closed his eyes, then added, Loranth is a good name. I agree, said a voice practically in Jax's ear, that a battle-ready, stealthy vessel such as this one would be a fitting recipient for Loranth's name. Jax swung around. Five? The little pit droid with I-5's voice had stalked across the landing pad, with Jerry following triumphantly in his wake. The odd-looking droid turned its single, oversized eye to the vessel, giving her a sweeping once-over. She looks like a good fit. So do you, Deegan said tentatively. A bit, um, different than last time I saw you. Think of me as a work in progress. Sasha gave him a wry once-over. You're a bit more outspoken than Ducky was, too. Ducky, I-5 repeated. My pit droid, you're wearing him. She gestured at I-5's new armature. I hope it doesn't distress you. Nah, in fact, I'm happy to see his pitiful remains have been put to good use. Something in the tone of her voice and the tilt of her head made Ben suspect the X-Racer wasn't nearly so blasé as the remark implied. He crossed gazes with Jerry over the top of I-5's new head, now level with his own. He'd left the little Rodian in the workshop, supposedly working on some logistical problems caused by I-5's large cortex. Problems that, to the exhausted, emotionally drained Celestin, had seemed insurmountable. I see you solved the brain case problem. The Rodian shrugged. Yeah, well... Jerry, said I-5, is a resourceful and creative young sentient. Jerry grinned and ran a hand along I-5's carefully crafted brain case. He had created a sort of sagittal crest that ran from the front of the helm to the back in an elegant and gleaming ridge. It's got all sorts of shielding up there, too, and a special shock mount, not to mention that the crest is reinforced with triclad durasteel. If all else fails, he can serve as a battering ram. Jerry's ubiquitous droid, which had rolled up behind him on the platform, uttered a trill of what sounded to Din like mechanical laughter. I-5 swiveled his head to regard the other droid. I fail to see the humor. You would, Din muttered. Jax shook his head. I don't know if I'll ever get used to your voice coming out of that. Don't get used to it, I-5 advised him. I have no intention of staying like this. He advanced toward the interceptor with a delicate whir of servos. Jerry had certainly done a nice job on the mechanics. Correct me if I'm wrong, said I-5, addressing Deegan, but doesn't the Helix-class freighter have an LBE flight computer? The mech tech nodded. Enhanced, of course. Of course. Can you enhance it further to allow for direct interface with a second artificial intelligence? Meaning you? Meaning me, I-5 said. At least in my present incarnation. It's got a mount for an auxiliary R2 unit, but... That should do nicely, I think. But you're not an R2 unit. Not at the moment, no. I-5 turned to Jerry, gesturing toward the tunnels that led back to the underground facility. I have an idea. Are you ready for more science experiments? Jerry's face lit up, and his eyes seemed to grow bigger, if that were possible. Freezing, he enthused and loped off toward his workshop with both droids in tow. Jax watched them with an uneasy expression on his face. Then, would you go make sure they don't do anything that can't be undone? Den nodded, getting it. Things were changing a bit too fast for him, too. He followed his assistant and the droids from the cavern. So what's this plan of yours? Den asked I-5 when they'd reconvened in the workshop. It's easier to show you than to tell you, I-5 said, and reached up to release a catch on the underside of his helm. It flipped up to reveal a steel-mounting cage suspended in a well behind the droid's optics. Jerry and I were able to place my synaptic grid cortex into this case, which will allow it to be moved more easily from one receptacle to another. Din just blinked at him. That's, um, wow. So when you were talking about the R2, he trailed off as Jerry steered just such a unit out into the center of the workshop 
under the bright lights of his operating theater. You intend to interface directly with the ship through this astromech. Isn't that just freezing? Jerry asked enthusiastically. Man, I wish I had a droid who could think like this one. Candy's bleat eloquently conveyed complete outrage. Freezing, Din murmured and dived back into the work. Keeping his hands and mind busy distracted him from the hard reality of what it meant to return to Coruscant under their present circumstances. 7. Jax was letting nothing distract him from their return to Coruscant. He had wasted a day and a half. It was enough. He had a deadline now, a window of opportunity in which to try to track Vader's movements since the ambush. The Interceptor would be ready for her shakedown in two days' time. He needed to bring something back to Coruscant with him besides loss and grief. He needed to return with some sort of lead on Thizon Yaman and Darth Vader. To that end, he'd broached the subject with Arin Foley as they sat together in the mess hall of the subterranean complex. All I've got, he told her, is data from the escape pod. If I could get data from any ships or observation posts you have in the sector. No sooner asked than done, she said. We've been working on that angle already. Any conclusions? About where he went? No. But at first blush, it looks as if he used the gravimetric distortions around the twins to disguise his movements. Clearly, they had to have jumped into the area, then used ion propulsions to position their forces. Which would have left a trail. Exactly. So if you want to come to the command center... He really didn't want to be in the command center. He'd already noted that his presence had attracted much attention and speculation about who he was and where he'd come from. Is there any way I could work on this from some other, more private location? Arin nodded. Sure. There's a workstation slash conference room right next to the communications bay. I can have any data you want routed there. Do you want my help in going over it? No, he said more sharply than he meant to. I might need the tracking data from your ship, though. You might have picked something up. Something I failed to notice, he finished silently. She looked as if she were going to reply, but didn't. She just nodded and went to make arrangements for the data transfer. Jax was in the workstation when Din came looking for him about an hour later. They said I'd find you here. What are you doing? Jax looked up from the sim he was constructing from the several data streams he'd sampled from tracking stations and ships that fed the resistance telemetry. The work was slow and piecemeal, even with the help of the station AI. Trying to figure out where Vader came from and where he went, Den's face brightened. Looks like I got here just in time then. I've got just the thing to make the work go faster. A hot rod pit droid with all sorts of bells and whistles. Weaponry, force shields, redundant core mechanisms, and a throughput of a gazillion teraflops per second. The downside is that it comes with I-5's acerbic personality. Couldn't get Jerry to program that out of him. Jax took a deep breath and let it out. He wasn't sure he was ready for levity yet. Are you sure he's up to this? Have you run diagnostics on him? Up to it? Sure we've run diagnostics. He's fine. Well, okay, apart from having been blown to bits. Whatever reinforcements your dad put in Five's brain case saved his life, or facsimile thereof. He can do this. 
better than you can. He doesn't have to wait for the data to be visible before he decodes and understands what it means. Jax glanced down at the flat screen display he'd been studying. He wanted the data to be visible, needed it to be visible with an intensity he didn't understand. Somewhere in the data was the answer to a question, the question to which Jax Pavan really wanted, needed an answer. Why? Why had Laurent died, and was there a scenario in which she didn't die? If I-5 parses all of this, I might as well go climb a tree, Din. With all due respect, if we don't let him parse it, we might miss something. You mean I might miss something. Din opened his mouth, closed it, then opened it again and said, Yeah, that is what I mean. He was right. Jax knew he was right. The Jedi fought with himself over it momentarily, recognized both the futility and stupidity of the fight, and nodded. Right. You're right. I'm not thinking clearly. Let's bring in I-5. It was the right decision, as wrong as it felt. Within five minutes of putting I-5 in charge of the data streams, Jax realized another reason he'd been avoiding this collaboration. It reminded him forcibly that Laurent was gone. As long as he existed on his own, her specter agreed to stay at bay. When Din and I-5 weren't there, working as a team to remind him of her absence, he could pretend it was temporary. With the familiar voices in his ears, he knew it was not. He shook himself. He had to get used to this. There was no other option. I-5's new chassis lent the proceedings an air of considerable surrealism. The pint-sized droid eschewed a chair and seated himself on the workstation desktop, from which he manipulated the data by plugging a much-enhanced digit directly into a port. Jax shared what he'd been thinking about the Ion Trail and the need the 501st had to maneuver into the vicinity of the twins at subluminal speeds. I-5 confirmed the appropriateness of the approach immediately and within minutes had constructed a sim of the ambush from the cobbled-together outpost of a host of sources, including his own data from the Far Ranger. He displayed his sim via a holographic projection pod that Jerry had installed behind his optics. It showed the moment of their emergence from the twins, fractious gravitational fields, into the free space beyond, and the speedy approach of their reception committee. The Far Ranger was a bright point of blue light. The Imperial ships were red. Other traffic in the area was rendered in a muted green. Jax felt as if he had a lead weight in his chest, heavy and poisonous. The moment, frozen in time. There, said Den, ion trails. There were, indeed, ion trails. They ran like fine filaments of crimson thread away from the twins toward the galactic core. They ended at the point the ships entered local space just outside the twins' gravity well. That's where they came from, said I-5. Let's see if that's also where they went. He ran the sim forward in time, past the moment in which Jax had hesitated between ensuring Laurent's safety and Yemon's past the moment in which Laurent drew her last breath and said her last whispered words, past the moment when I-5 was blown apart, past the moment in which Thaizan Yaman was lost to the Dark Lord, past the moment in which the Far Ranger was shredded by the forces of the Twin Sons, and finally, past the moment when the blood-bright shards 
streaked away and disappeared into hyperspace. Din let out a low, chuffing sound that, for a Celestin, functioned like a whistle. They're not all headed back to the core. Some of them are outward bound. But Jax had noticed something else in the sim. Several separate patterns of green signatures that had also left threads exiting local space within the same short time period. Some were oriented in the same direction as the red signatures, while others seemed to have been headed for the core worlds when they jumped. What are these? He indicated each of four separate patterns. I-5 shifted the display to show the new pattern of points and trails in yellow. I would say those were formations of vessels in the vicinity of the twins that headed out at approximately the same time Vader's squadron did. When did they enter? I-5 ran the sim backward again to the point at which Vader's fist appeared from hyperspace. The pattern of crimson dots that represented Vader's 501st was augmented by a sun-bright scattering of yellow ones. They all came here together, apparently, said I-5. And look at this. He ran the sim forward in time again. One of the red points of light seemed to be headed off in company with a set of yellow ones. Jax watched as the ships separated into five groupings and moved toward the twins. Then the lone red light changed course, rejoining its fellows and moving toward the moment. Obviously, said Den quietly, those are Imperial squadrons. I'm honored to have required so much firepower. Jax rocked back in his seat. Vader. Vader had been in that lone ship, the one that had altered course. He had brought that many ships and assigned them different positions because he'd had only a general idea about where the Far Ranger might be. Something had changed his mind about that. Maybe he'd just picked up their signature, or maybe they'd done something to betray themselves. Jax supposed he might never know, but he did know the general direction Vader and his forces had taken, entering and leaving the area. Some of the ships had returned to the core, apparently, while others had gone elsewhere. That was all the tactical display revealed. Two groups of ships that jumped to hyperspace with different orientations. The question was, which group was Vader's command ship with, and was Yemon aboard? Din had tried a number of times to draw Jax into the modifications that he, Jerry, and I-5 were making to the droid. Modifications that, under any other circumstances, Jax would have taken a keen interest and even had a hand in. But Din found the Jedi was focused with laser sharpness on one thing and one thing only, tracking Vader's ship. He had searched myriad hypercom messages looking for mention of a fleet of Imperial vessels, or, barring that, a group of starfighters with an Imperial cruiser acting as a mothership. There was one vague report of an unexpected and brief Imperial presence on Mandalore, several others, less vague, of a large contingent of Imperial fighters moving through the galactic core. A decision had to be made, then, about which route they would try to trace, and there was no exact information on which to base that decision which meant that Jax Pavan must feel as impotent as Dendur did. Of course, Jax had the force to fall back on, so Din asked what he'd gleaned from that resource. Nothing, he'd said, but there was something about the way he'd said it that left Din with a cold, clammy sensation in the pit of his stomach. Did you even check? 
he wanted to ask, but didn't. Instead, he merely asked, Where are we going then? Coruscant. It makes the most sense that Vader's gone there, where the Emperor can oversee the interrogation and where he's got the best security apparatus in place. Where the Emperor can oversee the interrogation. Now there was a phrase that sent vacuum level chill through the bone. 8. The night before Lorant's shakedown, Jax couldn't sleep. Couldn't meditate. Could barely think straight at times. Though he knew that for the sake of his companions and the resistance, he had to pretend that he could. So, in the middle of the night, he decided he might as well move his few belongings onto the ship and get used to her feel. The Interceptor was much smaller than the Far Ranger, and Jax found that though the captain's quarters reflected the size differential, they were comfortable enough. He located a small place for the Misai tree on a tray that pulled out from the wall next to the bunk. The little smart pot the Misai now nested in was equipped with a set of contacts on the base that allowed it to sync with the ship's power grid. It used a delicate sensor array to monitor the plant's nutrient supply and liquid and kept it watered by pulling the needed moisture from the air. A soft yellow light glowed on the front of the shallow pot when the nutrient reservoir became depleted, and a proximity alarm sounded a gentle tone if it sensed movement in the vicinity of the hungry tree, a mechanical means for the Misai to ask for food. Jax swore he would never have occasion to see the light or hear the tone. Now he filled the reservoir with some crumbled bits of protein bar that the smart pot would break down into smaller component parts. Then he sat cross-legged on the floor of the cabin and tried to clear his mind. He focused on his breathing, on visualizing the force as ribbons of healing energy that wrapped themselves around him. As before, when he opened his eyes, he saw the energy pulsing and flowing up from the little tree, root to trunk, to delicate branch. It danced among the needles and sent filaments out toward him to entwine with the force ribbons he was generating. This was a new experience. He was surprised at the sense of warmth and serenity he felt watching the energy strands from the Misai mingle with his own. His meditative state deepened, and at last he was able to invoke the Jedi Matra. There is no emotion. There is peace. There is no ignorance. There is knowledge. There is no passion. There is serenity. There is no chaos. There is harmony. There is no death. There is the Force. He turned the words in his mind without delving too deeply into their meaning. The rhythm of them was what he craved. Yes, craved. That was the word. He'd spent days in turmoil. This softly eddying tranquility was balm. He savored it momentarily, then turned his thoughts to Thizan Yaman and to Darth Vader. There was a trembling in his concentration when he did that, but he held his thoughts steady. If he was to use the Force to help him find the Whiplash leader, he must be steady. He pictured I-5's holographic tracers of the Imperial ships as if they floated in the warp and woof of the Force energies around him. He reached into and through the image, groping for the darkness that would be Invader's wake. In a split second, he was back in the dimmy, smoky corridor on the Far Ranger, face-to-face -face mask with the Dark Lord. I have one more thing to take from you, Vader had said. Jax cringed away from the reality. Anakin Skywalker had said that. Anakin had taken Loranth from him. Yimon, too. 
And more, how much more, Jax was only just beginning to realize. Why? Why was the Dark Lord toying with him as a predator toys with its prey? What possible benefit did the Empire derive from that? The answer came in an epiphany. This wasn't about the Empire or the Emperor. Vader had said it himself. He obeyed the Emperor in his own way. This was about Vader's choices, not Palpatine's. What was it the Cephalon had said? Choice is loss. Indecision is all loss. Had that been as true for Anakin Skywalker as it was for Jax Pavan? Had there been a moment in which the Dark Lord might have engaged him in battle, perhaps killed or captured him, and had the man behind the mask missed that opportunity in his own moment of indecision? Why do you hate me? Jax murmured. What have I done? The answer came to him as strongly as if he had spoken it aloud. He had survived. He had survived Order 66, and he existed to this day as a reminder of what? Of failure? Was Jax merely the one who got away? Or was there more to it than that? When he looks at me, does he see what he might have been? Jax's memory provided him with a startlingly vivid image of sparring with Anakin at a time when he had assumed he and his friend might both someday achieve the station of Jedi Master. That had been his aim, anyway, though he had often been struck with the uneasy sense that Anakin was not content with that. He reached into the small pocket in the sash of his tunic that housed the pyronium Anakin had given into his care. It gleamed on his palm a gem the size of a small egg, iridescent and otherworldly. It was an unknown quantity, alleged to be the source of unimaginable power, a power that was also allegedly to be called forth if one only knew the secret, and that, Jax had been led to believe, was revealed on the Sith holocron he had received from Hananem Tikrinan, the holocron that his father, Lorne Pavan, had once tried to acquire. Another unknown quantity. Jax still had the holocron, but he had never attempted to access the knowledge it contained. Sith holocrons were rare, powerful, and reputed to be deeply disturbing to the Force, and seductive to Jedi who interacted with them, unprepared for the assault that deep a store that deep a store of dark knowledge could make on reason. The holocron created a slight disturbance in the Force through its very existence. At least, Jax could feel its subtle pull when he was near it. And he had not wanted to risk attempting to activate it. Truthfully, he doubted he had the capacity to do that now. His fractured concentration rendered his unease with the Sith artifact Irrelevant. Jax glanced up at the shelf the Mesai sat upon. The holocron was tucked into a small trove in the rear wall of the niche created when the shelf was extended from the bulkhead. He was sometimes tempted to lose both the pyronium and the holocron by entombing them somewhere so he'd never have to think of either again. But he hadn't followed through on the impulse. The thought of having them fall into the hands of Darth Vader was blood-chilling, so he kept them close, reasoning that someday he might find a legitimate use for them. Certainly, neither had pleasant memories attached. By the time Anakin had given him the Pyronium to keep for him, he'd said, Jax had already had concerns about his friend. He remembered the first time he had glimpsed Anakin in a moment of anger, radiating tendrils of blackest night, whipcords of darkness that had writhed about him, straining outward. 
They had been sparring with their lightsabers, and something, to this day Jax wasn't sure what, had transformed the other Jedi from an amicable, if distracted, sparring partner into a driven foe. He had suddenly launched himself at Jax like a berserker, forcing him to parry a swift series of blows that might easily have killed him. Jax had seen darkness in auras before, but never like that, and never in a fellow Padawan. Anakin had appeared in that moment to stand at the nexus of a whirl of rage and frustration. He was a black hole, sucking light and color from anything or anyone in his gravitational field. That moment had passed so swiftly that Jax thought he'd imagined it. He'd been left reeling and confused and embarrassed when Anakin had broken off the attack, grinned at him, slapped his shoulder, and asked, What's the matter, Jax? Am I too much for you? Later, he'd been on the verge of telling his master what he'd sensed, but the fact that even Anakin's own master, Obi-Wan Kenobi, watching from the sidelines, seemed not to have noticed anything had silenced him. If Jax had spoken of what he'd felt then, would things have been different? Had that been yet another moment in which choice was loss and indecision deadly? He drew in a sharp breath and tried to marshal his thoughts, slipping the pyronium back into his sash pocket. The tendrils of darkness that he had once thought imaginary, he now knew were the threads of Darth Vader's immense potential power. He thrust down images of the Jedi Temple, the sparring circle, the memories of Flame Knight that threatened suddenly to intrude. He called back the mental image of I-5's tactical display, then reached into it, toward that one bright spot of crimson, seeking the darkness that always eddied in Darth Vader's wake. No. The uneasiness stopped him just short of putting his hand on the trailing edge of that darkness. He'll sense you. He'll know you seek him. The far ranger, filled with smoke and the smell of burnt flesh, emergency lights flickering, Laranth lying dead behind him on the deck. He thrust the memory down and reached again. Leave it for now. Let him think you might be dead. Jax hesitated in the act of touching the darkness, wary of his own uncertainty. Vader, standing in the smoky corridor, coldly taunting. Jax opened his eyes and flung himself to his feet, panting. Was there no situation that did not require choice? Was there nothing he might do without indecision? He looked around him at the snug cabin, laid a hand on the metal bulkhead. It was neither warm nor cool to the touch. The ship was silent. Not even the ventilation system was audible as it breathed warm air into the compartment. He imagined the vessel was waiting for him to do something, to decide something. He did. He decided to leave the ship and return to his quarters in the underground complex. He left his belongings and the Misai tree behind. The shakedown, Cruz, went off without a snag. I-5's brain was successfully paired with an R-2 unit that Jerry had scavenged from storage and fitted neatly into the ship's astrogation system. The setup gave the interceptor the reflexes of a bat falcon as swiftly as I-5 could conceive of a maneuver the ship could execute it. If they found themselves in a battle situation, that ability to make seamless, split-second decisions could mean the difference between success and failure, or life and death. The shakedown completed, the ship refueled and laden with a couple of crates of I-5's spare parts, Jax, Din, and I-5 stood on the landing pad in Mountain Home with their hosts. Besides Deegan Kaur and Aaron Foley, there were a handful of others, including Sasha Swiftbird and Jerry. 
Deegan had offered to send Sasha along with Jax to facilitate any necessary repairs on the ship and to serve as emissary from the Toprawan resistance. Jax had declined the offer. I don't know what sort of situation we're going to be confronting on Coruscant, he'd explained. Whiplash is in the process of reorganizing itself. The Imperials may be in a state of heightened security or even heightened aggression. Vader is very likely to take Yaman there to interrogate him. I don't want to put anyone else's life in danger unnecessarily. He didn't add that the presence of a woman on the ship would only underscore Laranth's absence. Put my life in danger? Sasha objected. I'd be there to protect you, Pavan, not the other way around. I'm not doubting your capabilities, he'd started to hedge, but she fixed him with that too direct gaze and he'd swallowed the words. I know what you're doing. You're not comfortable with me. I get that. I wouldn't let it push me into stupid decisions if I were you. He'd opened his mouth to respond, and she'd stopped him. Yeah, yeah, I know. I'm not you. I was just going to say, I don't think the decision is stupid. You could be of help, yes. You could also be out of your element. Arin says you've rarely been off Toprawa, and that you've never been to Imperial Center. It's a, a different sort of place. She gave him a lopsided grin. You may not be in the way and possibly call unwelcome attention to myself by gulping at everything. Something like that. She'd shrugged and dropped the subject. Neither she nor Deegan brought it up again. Their farewells were brief, and their hold was full of useful items for the whiplash, including some of the ionite and a selection of droid parts for I-5 and DIN to experiment with. They lifted off in the dead of night without running lights, piloted by the droid's R2 persona. Once in hyperspace, I-5 completed integrating the vessel's false identity into its every virtual nook and cranny. For obvious reasons, it could not be the Laranth in galactic records. People who knew of Jax Pavan might associate that name with him. He hadn't cared what she was called when it came down to it. She was just a ship. Din rechristened her Corsair. And so it was Corsair that bore Jax and his companions back to Coruscant. 9. The Corsair, a small, independent freighter registered to a tiny consortium on Toprawa, landed at a satellite docking facility of the West Port that was geared to handle vessels of diminutive size. She nestled in among a dozen or so ships of the same tonnage on a landing platform and disgorged her crew. A human male with dark, unkempt hair, a Sullustan mechanic, and a pit droid that had been tasked with carrying their belongings. To the casual observer, the ship and her complement were ordinary and unworthy of any particular attention. But to those who had been keeping an eye out for just such an occurrence, the landing of a small ship out of Toprawa with a shiny new registry, for all that it seemed to have been buried in the system for five years, the event signaled the need for quick action. And so, when Corin Vigil and his crew stepped into the terminal building with the intent of taking a turbo lift to the deep sublevels, they were met with an escort. A Zabrak official wearing a worn, dark long coat and accompanied by two uniformed officers flashed credentials at them. Jax Pavan didn't need to see the credentials. He knew whom he was dealing with. Corin Vigil, I need to take you in for questioning, if you don't mind. Actually, even if you do mind. Jax stared at the other man. May I ask what this is about? There's a problem with the registration on your ship and a certain connection to someone who's gone missing. Jax nodded. 
shifting his weight from one foot to the other. The Zabrak regarded him with wry amusement. I do hope you're not going to do anything rash, like try to run off on me. I assure you my associates here are used to that sort of thing. They rather enjoy a good run, in fact. Jax sighed. Look, Prefect, I don't know what this is about, but come with me and you'll find out. Come where? Imperial Security Bureau. Bender let out a hiss of breath. Great mother of all! The Prefect pointed a long grayish finger at him. Language! He herded them into a lift, and they shot down into the bowels of the terminal, exiting into a cavernous parking area. A pair of police speeders were drawn up to the curbing in front of the terminal's transperisteel doors. The two uniforms prodded the prisoners into the back seat of the vehicles, carefully locking the hatches from the outside. Then they saluted the prefect smartly went to their own vehicle, and sped off. The prefect watched them go, then slid into the front seat of the air car, started it, and took to the lanes. He said nothing as he drove his passengers deeper and deeper into the Duracreet canyons. Finally, Jax spoke. Prefect House, we're clearly not going to the ISB. Where are you taking us? Paul House looked up into the monitor that gave him a clear view of the vehicle's back seat. Of course we're not going to ISB. What the hell would I be taking you to the ISB for? As for where we are going, we are there. Even as he spoke, House pulled in behind an old police barrier and brought the air car to a stop. Before them was a disreputable-looking building with a blackened facade and street-facing windows that looked like blank eyes. The prefect popped the locks on the doors of the police speeder. They opened with a hiss of hydraulics. Everybody out! Din's heart was hammering in his throat as he climbed out of the police air car and looked around. House had brought them to an abandoned transit terminal, some long-dead remnant of the planet city's maglev system, there wasn't another sentient in sight, which did nothing to calm Din's nerves. Is this the part where you pull out a blaster and frag all of us? House turned and looked down at him with an air of exasperated bemusement. No, this is where I deliver you to interested parties. He started walking in the direction of the ancient building, his coat fluttering around him, like the wings of a hawk bat. Din looked up at Jax, who took a deep breath and strode after the police prefect. I-5, Jax murmured. Keep a laser on him, okay? Done, said the droid, and Din knew he would be doing exactly that. One of the modifications he had made on his DUM chassis was to replace the light emitter next to his optic unit with a weapons-grade laser. Paul House had sought their help a number of times in the past, and he had helped them in turn, drawing closer and closer to an alliance with Whiplash. But things were inside out now, and for all they knew, House could be in the service of the enemy, might somehow even be the mole that had leaked their plans to move Thizon Yimon. This fact was not lost on Den. Jax's mind was apparently moving along the same avenues, for once they were inside the abandoned terminal, he asked the prefect, What do you know about... the situation? More than you're probably comfortable with me knowing. This way... House led on past several long, deserted concierge counters and down a darkened concourse to what was clearly the entrance to a maglev embarkation platform. Din peered into the gloom of the tube. The walls were no longer gleaming and smooth, but neither did they look as derelict as he'd expected. House pulled out a comlink and spoke into it. 
I have a delivery for immediate pickup. There was a curt answer from the other side of the link. House pocketed the device and turned to Jax and Din. They'll be here in a few moments. I just wanted to say... He hesitated, and Din realized he'd never seen House show this level of diffidence. Feigned cluelessness. Irascibility. Surliness, even. But not hesitance. I'm sorry to hear about Loranth. Yimon, too, of course, but... He shook his shaggy head. I'm just sorry. I know what it's like to lose someone that close. Jax was regarding the prefect with solemn intensity. He held his gaze for a moment, then nodded. Thank you. You lose your smart mouth droid too, did you? He did not, I-5 said crisply. Lose his smart mouth droid. The Zabrak stared at the little pit droid, then uttered a bark of laughter. Glad to hear it. With a bow wave of cold, oily air and a soft whisper of brakes, a hover train glided out of the darkness of the tunnel and stopped on the platform. A door hissed open in the first car. Paul House tilted his head at it. All aboard! Din gawped. We're going to HQ on an old maglev? Not exactly. House herded them into the train. The interior of the vehicle had been stripped of its original passenger seating and now looked more like a vestibule in someone's corporate offices. Before they could ask whom they were going to see, the door to the next car opened and Tudin Sal appeared. The Sakian's smile came nowhere near inhabiting his eyes. Hello, Jax. Din. I-5. The droid inclined his head with a click. I wish we were reuniting under less... Sal seemed at a loss for words. Under less dire circumstances, he finished, then gestured to the car behind him. Welcome to Whiplash HQ. Come on in. Even as Sal led them into the second car, the train closed its doors and left the station. Din was surprised at that, but even more surprised that Paul House came with them into the inner sanctum. They sat around a low table in the second car. Tudin Sal, Jax, Din, Paul House, and four whiplash captains. A Tagruta poetess named Sheel Mafane, the Ammonin owner of Sill's place, Fars Silat, a Deveronian songstress named Diet Agni, and a human black market trader named Acer Ash. I-5 stood between Jax and Din. Paul House had taken a seat to Jax's right, the place Loranth usually occupied. How long, Jax wondered, would it be before he stopped reminding himself of where Loranth would be or what she'd be doing if she were here? Do you have a sense, Tudin Sal was asking him, of how Vader might have known where you were? Jax shook his head. None. Maybe they... Maybe it was the ship? She might have been compromised in some way. Maybe there's a mole. There were only six of us in the room when we made those plans. We swept the safe house for surveillance equipment before we pulled out. There was none. None of us, Fars Silat said, tipping his large head to indicate his fellow captains was aware of how Yemon was getting off-world or when, and clearly the ISB had no idea where our previous headquarters was, else they'd have come in and wiped us out. They're not subtle that way. What about your contacts on Toprawa? Sal asked. The Rangers. Could one of them or their associates have turned traitor? It was a horrific possibility, but a real one, and it made Jax shudder. Ostensibly, he said slowly, only a handful of people in Toprawa's operation knew about the move. Deegan Kaur, Arin Foley, a mech tech named Sasha Swiftbird. Foley could be the spy, the Sakian mused. She had a mission go belly up on her last year. Her two accomplices were caught, 
she wasn't. A chilling thought, but if the ranger had betrayed them, wouldn't Jax have sensed something in her bearing? Even as he was now sensing the waves of tension and fear washing out from Tudin Sal and his confederates? Maybe not. Maybe not, given the emotional state he'd been in at the time. If one of them was a betrayer, Sheil Mafane suggested, certainly Jax or Laranth would have sensed it. A wave of relief rolled over Jax. Both he and Laranth had met with Arryn before their disastrous mission. Neither of them had sensed anything about her then. If there was a spy, it was not the Antarian Ranger. Or at least not that Antarian Ranger. There was still Sasha Swiftbird. She hadn't been with the Rangers for that long, and she had tried to make a case for him bringing her back to Coruscant with him. He was looking into the faces of these comrades in arms and realized that this rampant distrust was, in part, his doing. It could paralyze them if he let it. They couldn't let it. We have to trust someone, Sal, Jack said. If we're going to get Yemon back, we have to trust our allies because we're going to need them, and they are going to need us. There is one member of Arin Foley's group who might bear watching. I'll make sure Arin is aware of it. If, the Deveronian repeated gruffly, if we get Yemon back, one must wonder what the odds of such a thing are. You've chosen an interim leader, I assume, I-5 said, calling abrupt attention to his diminutive presence. Sal shook his head. We have determined that we must have not one leader, but many, each with different spheres of responsibility. Paul House, for example, is chiefly responsible for intelligence and security. Jax turned to the police prefect. He is? It seemed to make the most sense, said Sal. He has insider knowledge of the workings of the ISB, and he knows how to keep us well hidden. This, he gestured around them at the hover train, was his doing. Jax stifled a twinge of distrust. Paul House had been in a position to give them up repeatedly and hadn't. He'd run interference for them, made sure the Imperial Security Bureau was looking the other way, hidden whiplash operatives, and been in close contacts with Jax and Yemon. He'd had every opportunity to kill or capture them and hadn't. Still, so you're in all the way now, he asked the prefect. House nodded. I'm in. If this has proved one thing to us, Sal said. It's that having all our credits in one bank doesn't make sense. Our leadership needs to be redundant, and yet each of us requires a certain autonomy and a certain amount of overlap. Paul House was watching Jax intently. Of course, now that you're here, I, for one, am perfectly willing to relinquish. Jax shook his head adamantly. No, I can't lead you. I can't take Yaman's place. It's because of me that we're having to replace him. It's up to me to get him back. Is that even possible? Sal asked. As strong a mind as Thizon Yaman has, Vader will eventually break him. Yaman wouldn't betray the resistance, Jax murmured. No, Din said quietly. But what if he doesn't have a choice? Do we know what tech the Emperor's got up his bloody sleeves? Do we even know what Vader is capable of? No, Jax didn't know what Darth Vader was capable of. Aboard the dying Far Ranger, he thought he had seen him fail to manipulate Thizon Yaman's mind and have to settle instead for manipulating gravity. Still, I've never known a Force user as powerful as Vader, he admitted which only makes it more critical that we rescue Yemon. Paul House slouched back in his chair. How do you propose we do that? At the moment, we have no idea where they might have taken him. He could be here on Coruscant, or he could be at any Imperial stronghold. And if we do determine where he is, how do you propose we rescue him? There's every chance that Vader will only use him as a trap to catch you, 
You're the real prize, Pavon, and I think you know it. Jax was shaking his head. No, he could have gotten me at the same time he took Yaman. If he'd really wanted me... You're not thinking clearly, Jax, said Din. Loranth had just blown a hole in Vader's vessel and shut down his tractor beam. He was out of time. He thought we were, too. He thought the interstellar flux would take us out. It's only thanks to Arin Foley and her crew that it didn't. Den was right. Jack stared at his friend without seeing him. He didn't have to kill me. He'd already done worse. Whatever Vader's reasoning, Sal said sharply, we have work to do. We are in the process of scrapping our network and starting fresh. We have abandoned every stronghouse, every drop point, every pass-through, every escape corridor, because Thizon Yemon could jeopardize every one of them. Anger flared in Jax's heart. He'd die first. I hope you're right. Jax stood as if the padded seat had shocked him. Yemon is your friend. The Sakian looked up at him warily. Yemon was our captain, our counselor, our leader. We have to go on as if he is gone for good. He'd expect it of us, don't you think? Jax started to protest. Let me put it another way, Sal said. Do you think Thizon Yemon would want us to jeopardize the entire organization to locate and rescue him, sacrificing all our priorities? From the reactions of Paul House and the other operatives, Jax could tell this was not the first time they'd had this argument. There was anger at this nexus. Contention. House was staring at something invisible on the curving wall of the train car. His horned brow creased in a scowl. Fars, Acer, and Dyat were nodding grimly. Sheel was looking down at her clasped hands. Jax looked to Paul House. You agree that we should? Give up on Yemon? I do not, murmured Sheel under her breath. House put his hand on the Tegrudas to silence her as he met Jax's eyes. I think it's safe to say that Yemon would have argued that Whiplash needs to regroup, retool, and rethink its strategy, and do it quickly. We're in the process of that now, and when that's done... When that's done, Sal said, his voice tight, we need to strike at the Empire while they suppose us to be reeling from loss. This is a tragedy only if we allow it to be. If we view it instead as an opportunity to act in ways the Emperor would never expect us to, it will remain but a personal loss, not a loss for the Resistance. They suppose us to be a headless creature, but as Paul House has suggested, we have six or seven heads where before we only had one, and each head is capable of directing the efforts of the body. Strike? Jax repeated. Strike how? Sal's gaze touched briefly on the faces of his cohorts. That hasn't been decided yet, but it must be divisive and devastating. Jax spread his hands in a gesture of entreaty. What would be more devastating than snatching Yemon out of the Emperor's grasp? Tudin Sal grimaced. Perhaps if we had even a glimmering of where he is. We have a glimmering, said I-5. The assertion brought a sudden silence. Go on, said Paul House. I have traced the route Vader's forces took to get in and out of the area they trapped us in. We are fairly certain that some of the vessels, possibly even Vader's, made a call on Mandalore, then went on from there toward the Mid-Rim. Some of the vessels? The larger part of the Legion came back to the core. Yimon may even be here on Coruscant at this very moment. If we put our forces into finding him... We cannot, the Deveronian growled. Throw everything into finding Yimon. You are not even certain of his whereabouts. In truth, he may already be dead. Even if he is not, every resource we dedicate to finding him is a resource we do not have for our other larger tasks. 
She ended her statement with her gleaming red eyes focused on Tudensel. Is that not right? Sal shifted in apparent discomfort. Diat is correct. In your absence, Jax, we have moved forward on plans to strengthen our contacts within the Imperial Security Bureau. If we have to curtail those efforts, we will lose any ground we have gained. You have been gone, Diat told Jax, for over a month. That is long enough to have thrown this entire organization into turmoil, from which we have only recently emerged. Consider the consequences, Jax Pavan, if Darth Vader has done this, with the full expectation that we will, as you suggest, pour all our resources into retrieving our stolen leader. The words hit Jax like a physical blow. He sat down, feeling as if his legs had been swept out from under him. You're right. He leaned against the back of the seat, closing his eyes. We can't bend all our resources to finding Yemon. But without those resources, we'll never get him back. Jax looks like he could use some downtime, Paul House said brusquely. Of course, said Tudensal. If you don't mind... Jax felt a touch on his arm and opened his eyes to find Paul House standing next to him. Why don't I show you and your team to your new quarters? Jax nodded silently and rose to follow the prefect into the next car. Din and I-5 brought up the rear. House led them through a lounge car that offered an open common area to replete with food service machines and various seating areas. The car behind that was a sleeper with two private compartments accessed from the left-hand corridor. This one is Sal's. House nodded toward the first door on the right. The next one I use on occasion. They proceeded through the next car to a door near the far end. Will that do for you, Din? The Sullustan shrugged and started to move in that direction. He hesitated and looked back over one shoulder. Five, you come in with me, or... I believe I will remain with Jax for the time being. Din glanced at Jax and nodded. Good idea. When Din had closed his door, Paul House ushered Jax into his guest quarters. They were more than adequate, being twice the size of the captain's cabin aboard the Laranth. There was a bed that lowered from the wall, a seating area, even a small bar at which one might eat with a guest. I-5 entered first, checked the place over, and stationed himself by the door. Jax just stood in the middle of the floor, feeling momentarily directionless. Not everyone agrees that we should write Yaman off as lost, Paul House said. At least Sheil and I aren't on board with the idea. Factions? I-5 asked. House turned to look at the droid. I wouldn't go that far. Just uncertainties. They're not used to operating without strong leadership, but at the same time, they're a bit leery of electing a single strong leader again. The Empire seems to function with a single strong leader, I-5 observed. An absolute ruler, in fact. The Empire's leadership is in a position of power. The Emperor rules through secrecy and fear, while he has only one thing to fear himself. Well, that is, if he's smart enough to fear it. Vader. The word dropped from Jax's lips like a stone. Yeah, Vader. Am I right? Vader. A random element. I'd like to give the Emperor more to fear, Jax murmured. House's lips curled wryly. Then you and Sal should be on the same wavelength. Jax roused himself and turned to regard the police prefect. Should I be? Should I just leave Yemon in Vader's hands? Just move on? What does the force sense of yours tell you? That I should not. Can't argue with the force. House sketched a salute and left the compartment. Jax stared after him, aware that there was a wealth of subtext there that he was too weary to grasp. Lie down, Jax, 
said I-5, before you fall down. He did, but just barely. 10. Sleep had come with difficulty. Jax's emotions were still clouding things, and his mind seemed determined to take dark paths his soul did not wish to tread. He slept restlessly, pulling himself out of turbid dreams before they could take hold. In the most benign of these dreams, he saw I-5's tactical display of Vader's fist as it intercepted the Far Ranger, took the ship, and fled with Yemon. In dreams, he saw what he had not allowed himself to witness in the tactical display, that moment when the blue light that was Far Ranger winked out of existence, torn apart by the competing gravitational forces of the twins. As much as he wanted to wake then, he didn't. He couldn't. Instead, he watched the fleet of bright dots speed away and slip into hyperspace to emerge near Mandalore. In his dream, he saw that emergence too, and woke, wondering again why Vader would make a stop on Mandalore. Did it have anything to do with his prisoner? When he finally gave up on sleep, Jax meditated but he found it hard to concentrate without the Misai to serve as his point of focus. It did not help that the seemingly dormant pit droid had stationed himself in one corner of the room. Jax returned to his bed and slept, but fitfully. When he woke, I-5 was gone. Jax emerged from his quarters, feeling only half awake. His mind wanted to dart here and there. He went in search of something to eat. The lounge was empty. He availed himself of the food and drink dispensers. He looked out the long, horizontal slits that served as windows. Not much to see, just flickers of light as they moved through the maglev tunnels. They were in motion now but Jax knew they'd stopped during the night, where he had no idea. He had to admit it was brilliant of Paul House to have come up with this way of protecting the Whiplash leadership, by using the underground maglev literally, rather than as a metaphor. Jax turned at the sound of a door opening and closing to see that Din and I-5 had entered the car. Din didn't look as if he'd slept well. His oversized eyes were bloodshot, and his eyelids drooped. You look like I feel, Jax told him. My condolences, the Celestin said, and went to get a steaming cup of calf and a protein cake. I-5, though Jax still had trouble thinking of this pint-sized droid as I-5, moved gracefully to the table where Jax was sitting and surveyed the Jedi with his single oculus. Condolences, indeed, said the droid. You did not sleep more than two, perhaps three, hours last night, and most of that was in short naps. After your first wakeful period, you got hardly any REM sleep, which means you're not dreaming. I thought you were in region and I'd rather not dream if it's all the same to you. It's not all the same to me. REM sleep is necessary to most sentient's well-being. If you don't get the required amount, there could be repercussions, ranging from depression, exhaustion, and hallucinations, all the way to a possible psychotic break. Yes, all right, I know. I may have to medicate you, I considered doing it last night, but reasoned that you'd be displeased if I did it without permission. Din snorted volubly and set down his calf on the table. I'm sure this please doesn't begin to cover it. I don't want to be medicated, Jax said quietly. Even as he spoke the words, he knew a niggle of guilt. It seemed somehow wrong to shut the dreams out. She inhabited them still, 
He thought longingly of the Misai tree, still in his quarters aboard the ship. We won't be here that long, he told himself. So what's on the agenda for today? Din asked. I-5 uttered a muted beep. Must there be something on the agenda? Perhaps you two should just take this chance to rest and restore yourselves. We're going to do reconnaissance work today, Jax said. I-5, I need you to sniff around space traffic control. Talk to the AI if you can. See if there's been any unusual activity. Such as incoming vessels from the 501st? Exactly. I'm going to find Paul House and see if he's heard anything interesting out of the ISB. We need to locate Vader. Din looked at him shrewdly. You're not going to let this go, are you? Are you ready to let it go? To let Yemon go? They locked gazes for a long moment, then Din sighed deeply and shook his head again. May the Warren Mother help me. No. No, I'm not ready. It might be wise, however, I-5 said, to let Tudin Sal believe that we are, for the time being. Jax nodded and took another sip of the steaming calf. He hated being anything less than completely honest with his comrades in arms, but dissension in the steering group was the last thing they needed. As far as Tudin Sal and the others would know, Jax Pavan was grabbing some much-needed downtime. Only Paul House would be privileged to know how far that was from the truth. Disguised as a UB's merchant, Jax appeared at Paul House's headquarters, presumably to lodge a complaint against a Sulliston trading partner. He bolstered his way into the prefect's office and, once in House's presence, paced the floor until he had located any surveillance devices, then placed himself so that his gloved hands were visible to none of them. May I ask, Howells said, eyes narrowed, why one of my lieutenants couldn't help you? Jax struck a belligerent pose and asked, in the mechanically amplified croak common to the UBs, Speak, you, you been an all? Howes's eyes dropped to his own hands. Yes, but I'm not as good at signing it as I am reading. Then I shall speak, and you shall listen. A creature of Sullust has stolen my favored pit droid. I demand that you come with me at once and confront him. That was what Jack said aloud. What he signed in the UB's non-verbal lingo was something entirely different. Your pit droid, Howes repeated, scratching around the base of his left horn. He glanced from Jax's hands to his eyes, hidden behind the lenses of the face mask UB's wore when among alien races. I could have one of my associates. Not good enough. This Sullustin creature will not respect our associates. He believes himself above the law. I suspect he is aligned with Black Sun. Really? Howes watched Jack's sign his real intent, then nodded. Black Sun, you say? Imagine that. He is a thief. He is more than a thief. I have proof. You come. Paul Howes rose from his form chair and moved to snag his disreputable coat from a hook by the door. If you can prove what you say, sir, I will be happy to accompany you. They descended to the constabulary's vehicle park and took Paul Howes's speeder out into the Gray Canyons. Where are we going? Howes asked. Plowtechel Market. They reached that spot in silence. Howes parked the speeder and they got out by mutual consent, losing themselves in the noise and activity of the bazaar. It was the same as always, a barrage of sound and movement, an explosion of vivid colors overlaid on the cold and dark grime of Coruscant's substructure. Jax heard the chatter of a dozen worlds, basic 
being spoken in another two dozen accents. Laughter. Argument. In short, life going on. Jax shook himself, uttered a rasping sigh. Howells glanced sideways at him. What do you need? Jax shut off the voice amplifier and spoke normally, his head tilted toward Howells's, so only the prefect would hear. Information. I need to know if there's any unusual activity going on inside the ISB. What am I looking for? An inquisitor presence, or a heightened security level in the detention areas, maybe. As if they had a special prisoner? Yes. And if Vader's back. That I can tell you right now, because I've always got feelers out for Vader. He's on Coruscant. I got confirmation just before you showed up in my office. And according to my sources, most of his legion returned with him which kind of makes you wonder where the other ships went, and why. It did make Jax wonder, but he was momentarily consumed by the idea that he and Vader were sharing a planet. Warring impulses raced through him, to find Vader and confront him, or to get as far away from him as possible. Could the Dark Lord feel his presence here? Did he know he had not killed Jax Pavan? Was Jax endangering Whiplash by his mere presence? Howells stopped walking and turned to face Jax. Does Sal know you're still thinking about going after Vader? I'm not thinking about going after Vader. I'm thinking about going after Yemon. And no, Sal doesn't know. Are you going to tell him? Do you intend to interfere with his plans for Whiplash? Of course not. Then I have no reason to tell him, do I? I want Yaman back, too. The prefect turned and started walking again. Why doesn't Sal? The Zabrak made an impatient sound. I think you're reading him wrong. I think he wants Yaman back. He just believes, for the reasons he cited, it's dangerous to dedicate all of the organization's resources to it. But... A sidewise glance. Who said there was a but? Give me some credit, Howes. I haven't lost my force sense. I can read your ambivalence. And I'm aware that Sal's reluctance is soul deep. The prefect laughed. Though Jax detected no humor in him. But I think he could afford to dedicate some resources to finding Yaman. To give him his due... I think he probably doesn't want you to be among them. At least, if I were in his position, I wouldn't want to lose you to a quest. But... Jax prodded again. But I'd also understand that if you don't give your all trying to get Yemon back, you might as well be off-world. Sal needs you. Whiplash needs you. But it needs you with your head on straight your heart in one piece, and your soul not stretched like a super string between here and wild space. It needs you doing what you do best, furthering the resistance. Jax stopped and regarded the police prefect with wry appreciation, meeting his deceptively lazy amber eyes. You don't miss much, do you? Give me some credit, Pavan. I don't miss anything. Jax parted company from House in the heart of the marketplace. As he walked, he felt a strange combination of restlessness, impatience, and exhaustion. He chafed at having to wait for information. He wanted something to act upon, some certainty of direction. Was Yemon here or somewhere else? If he wasn't on Coruscant, then why was Vader here? Deep in thought, Jax lost track of where he was, until he looked up and recognized the neighborhood. The Cephalon, who had summoned him before they'd left Coruscant on their failed mission, 
lived only meters from the corner where he stood. He stopped and gazed down the plaza to the entry of the Cephalon's building. Why here? What did he imagine Aoloi Loa might tell him if he showed up on its doorstep? What did he want it to tell him? Here's what you did wrong, you ridiculous human. Why didn't you listen to me? Are you deaf, blind, insensate, all of the above? He meant to turn around and retrace his steps to the market, but didn't. Instead, he let his feet carry him to the Cephalon's tower. He signaled his desire to come up, to be granted an interview. Maybe he'll just tell me to go away. But the Cephalon didn't tell him to go away. And so, committed, Jax entered, arriving in the antechamber to find that Aoloi Loa had acquired a couple of new sculptures since his last visit. It seemed, in fact, to be admiring them when Jax stepped up to the window and greeted it, removing his UB's mask and voice amplifier. Aoloiloa turned slowly and bobbed over to the window. You have will return? The words scrolled across the communications display in the anteroom. I return and I return to tell you that I experienced the truth of your words. Choice is loss, indecision is all loss. I failed to make a choice and lost all. You wish, wished, will wish? I... he stalled. What did he wish? What did he expect the Cephalon would or could tell him? what he might have done differently or better? He already knew that, didn't he? I wish to know if there was anything I might have done to, to produce a different result. To not lose all? Yes, to not lose all. That is, was, will be a different path. Every choice makes, has made, will make its own path. Many trails lead, have led, will lead to crux. Crux, yes, you said that before. You said locus, dark crosses light, or dark will cross light, or dark has crossed light, or yes, locus, nexus, crux, dark and light. Cross, crossed, will cross. You mean that wasn't it? It hasn't happened yet? Or do you mean that it did cross and that I made the wrong choice? Went down the wrong path, whatever. The cephalon bobbed silently for a long moment, then said, Listen. Listen? Jax couldn't recall a time when he had heard a cephalon say anything that carried even that hint of urgency or command. I'm listening. Yemon's separation. Destroys, has destroyed, will destroy. Us. Jax's hair stood on end. That was the most intensely personal message he'd ever received from one of these ethereal sentients. Us? You mean the Cephalons? Or Whiplash? Or all of us. The words on the display looked the same as every other trail of letters and syllables. Yet, Jax's force sense, completely focused on the cephalon, told him that it was not the same. Aoloi Loa was disturbed by the words, perhaps even afraid. You mean he, he's going to betray the resistance? Your truth. Choice is loss. Indecision is all loss. Dark crosses, has crossed, will cross. Light. And makes gray? Jax asked reflexively. Eclipse, said the Cephalon. 11. Eclipse. Dark crosses light, 
blotting it out. Darkness reigns. But only for a time, Jax argued as he made his way back toward Plowtechel Market. Then the light returns. But how long a time? Was that what the Cephalon was telling him? That Yaman's separation, his capture by Vader, could bring about the eclipse of the resistance, of what little freedom and hope existed because of it. Certainly, the Jedi Order had already been eclipsed. For all Jax knew, he was the last living Jedi Knight. He had begun the training of only one Padawan, but Vader had seen to it that Kaj Savaros had been compromised, nearly destroyed, in fact. There was a part of Jax that saw that as a mercy. Kajin Savaros had possessed a sensitive nature, too much raw talent, little training, and even less self-control. The result could well have been even more catastrophic. Jax hated to think what Kaj, with his wounded soul, would have made of the loss of both Laranth Tariq and Thizan Yaman. The youth was at least safe where he was, spirited away to Shili and into the care of the silent, those most mysterious veiled healers. Jax felt a slight flutter among the muted streamers of the force that floated around him in the crowded marketplace. All sentient beings had some force signature. In most, it was faded, almost transparent. To a trained force user like Jax, the muted signature provided only a subtle background weave against which a more pronounced signature was like a bump or loop in the stream of the ordinary. He was experiencing such a bump now, a familiar one. He followed his sense and was not surprised when he found himself in front of Honest Yarg's Drug Emporium. All sales guaranteed. The heads-up banner floating above the tawdry shop also promised new and used, complete and parts, trade-ins welcome. The words were punctuated with the smiling effigy of Yarg himself. Yarg was a gran, a happy gran, if the holographic portrait of the waving sentient was any indication. Beneath his three half-open eyes, his bovine mouth affected as close to a human grin as possible for one of his species. Trust me, it said. Jax entered the Emporium and glanced around. There were half a dozen patrons from a variety of worlds, browsing through the inventory of complete and disassembled droids. The source of the Force signature was in the far right-hand corner of the warehouse. Even from this distance, Jax could tell that I-5 was bristling with very undroid-like umbrage, while Din Dur hands gesturing for calm, tried to communicate with the third figure in the tableau, the proprietor, Yarg. Jax approached the group, making sure his vocal filters had been switched back on. He picked up the gist of the animated conversation immediately. He does not wish to sell me, I-5 was telling Yarg emphatically. He has said this repeatedly. With as many sensory organs as you possess, you cannot have misunderstood this point. Least of all, the droid continued, ignoring Din's attempts to butt in. Does he wish to sell me for scrap? The point of this visit is to purchase a complete or even partial protocol unit, preferably an I-5YQ. And I have told you... The Grand replied mildly, gazing down at the little droid. Why it is that I have no I-5YQ models at this time. They have, as I have also told you, become quite rare, being antiques. Why, just last week, one of my buyers found one on Alderaan, priced at antiques, bleated I-5, on the verge of overtaxing his vocalizer. 
They are not antiques. They are vintage devices of. What is this? The grating tones of Jax's UB's voice box cut across the droid's objections. Six eyes turned to look at him. I send you to find a protocol droid, and you fall into a dispute with this kind of patient proprietor. Please finish your business without delay. Ben's eyes widened, and for a moment, Jax wondered if he'd forgotten what disguise the Jedi had adopted that morning. Then he bowed, bobbing several times, and apologizing both to Jax and to Honest Yarg. Is something amiss, sir? Den asked Jax, concern creeping into his expression. Is there some emergency? No emergency. I merely wish to be gone from this pestiferous planet as soon as possible. Have you business you must make with this sentient? He nodded his head toward Yarg. Actually, yes, I do. But our pit droid seems to have shorted a circuit or three. If you could take him outside, I see no reason. I five began. Jax silenced him with a gesture. Come, machine. We will let my associate haggle in peace. Outside, Jax moved to lean against the face of the building. After a moment of hesitation, I five moved to fold himself. Practically in half at the Jedi's feet. What was that all about? Jax asked quietly in his natural voice. The Gran, I five said, are a particularly frustrating species. They are careful to a fault, friendly also to a fault, and they love to tell long-winded, multi-generational stories. In fact, I believe they make them up on the fly as a matter of strategy. Figuring that you will buy the first thing that comes to hand just to get them to stop talking. Are you all right? Am I all right? Repeated the droid. He swiveled his single oculus to peer up into Jax's face, as if he could read his expression behind the UB's mask. What makes you ask? You're usually so careful about staying inside your droid persona. Pretending to be less than you are, I five looked away. I'm not used to the limitations of this chassis. Jax crouched next to him, bringing his goggled eyes on a level with the droid's single optic. You are not just a machine. If I needed anything else to remind me of that, I got it just now. I followed your force signature here, five. You're not even supposed to have a force signature. Your point. My point is that I haven't thought about how you. He hesitated. Try it again. It had not occurred to me to consider how what we've been through has affected you, until this moment. I forget sometimes what you are, and what is that, my friend. My father's friend, Lawrence's friend. The single Oculus focused on Jax's face. I am all of those things. I am even Din's friend, inexplicably. Jax smiled behind his face mask. Do you? Does this? Yes, the droid said simply. I do. It does. Perhaps I do not experience attachment or loss as you do, or as Den does, but I do experience it. Are you perhaps suggesting that I am compromised by this? I don't know. I just know that, under normal circumstances, it would be unusual for me to find you arguing with a sentient about the virtues of your previous chassis, and it's just occurred to me. That you might be missing that too. The metal helm tilted sideways. Interesting. I hadn't thought of that possibility. You may be right. Happens once in a while. Den came out of the shop, trailing a small anti-grav pallet piled with containers. You met with Howes, right? 
he asked Jax. What happened? What's wrong? Vader's on Coruscant. That's what's wrong. We need to move. Jax was back. At least, that's what it looked like from where Din Dur stood. He felt an overwhelming sense of relief to see the Jedi motivated and moving, planning. He wasn't thrilled about the prospect of snooping around the ISB and trying to track down Vader, but he recognized that it was their only way of finding Thizon Yiman. I-5 had been using his time to interface with any city subsystems that would allow him access. He'd had limited success, with the exception of something he'd stumbled across in the Empire's financial systems. A large amount of credits had flowed recently from Imperial coffers to several accounts on Mandalore. The Emperor was buying up someone's services, although with the identity of the account holders carefully hidden, it was hard to tell whose. Bounty hunters. That's what Din thought. Jax and I-5 agreed. But for what purpose? To hunt down Jedi? If so, that was one of the good news, bad news scenarios. Bad news. Vader was stalking Jedi. Good news. Vader believed there were still Jedi to stalk. They were in the throes of packing up their practically brand new belongings when Paul Howells turned up at one of the whiplash's rotating stops and boarded. He came directly back to Jax's quarters and dropped a sealed packet onto his bunk. What's that? Jax asked him. A Coruscant police uniform and Lieutenant Pips. I brought them for you to use the next time you need to pay me a visit at HQ. I can't have random characters cluttering up my office on a regular basis. It's too amusing to my staff. I have the feeling you're not going to get to use it, though. Why not? Jax asked him. What's going on? Something I don't understand. Vader is here. He's been seen in ISB headquarters, and he's reportedly met with Palpatine. But there's none of the sort of activity I'd expect to see if he'd brought a high-level prisoner with him. No reassignment of guards. No concentration of Inquisitors. In fact, and this is the really peculiar thing, the Inquisitors have been dispatched off-world or at least the cream of their crop has been. Jax set his shiny new pack down by the door of his compartment and gave the prefect his entire attention. Tesla? he asked. Howes nodded. Apparently, he and a number of the senior members of the group were shipped out of here yesterday. Shipped where? That is not a matter of record, even in the ISB. Vader gave the word and they took off directly from the Bureau's landing platform, took an Imperial transport with an unregistered itinerary. Which brings me to my other piece of news. Vader's long-range shuttle is sitting on the pad at the ISB right now, running pre-flight procedures. Where's it going? No clue. No itinerary and I'm not in a position to ask. Any idea when it might lift off? The prefect shook his head. We need to get to that spaceport, Jax said tersely. Now. While Jax and Din moved their meager belongings to the Loranth slash Corsair and picked up the droid parts they'd bought at Yarg's Emporium, I-5 ran pre-flight procedures and tried to ferret information about Vader's vessel out of the streams of data. With the cargo in the small hold, Jax went to the cockpit where I-5 was hunkered in front of the communications console. Anything? Actually, I was just about to hail you. It seems Darth Vader's ship is holding until 1400 hours, or so the captain told the flight controller at Eastport. 
Din came in out of the corridor to lean against the hatch frame. Why would he announce that to the flight controller at Eastport? Eastport is close enough to the Senate, Palace, and Security Bureau that any special traffic from those facilities changes the flight patterns for civilian craft. I thought, perhaps, monitoring Eastport's communications and any changes to their inbound and outbound traffic would prove enlightening. Good call, Jack said. Did the captain say why he's holding? No, just that he's holding. Jax checked his chrono. Five hours. He made a decision. I'm going up to the palace district to see if I can get close to Vader's ship. I-5 went so still that Jax thought for a moment the droid's joints had frozen. Why? If he's brought Yemon to Coruscant... He may be moving him to wherever he sent the Inquisitors. Or he might have sent Yemon on ahead with those other ships. But if he's here, Five, I might be able to get to him. Din stepped fully onto the bridge. Yeah, and it might be a trap. A trap? How? As far as he knows, I'm dead. When it comes to Vader, Din said, all bets are off. The Force only knows what Vader thinks. We should lie low here and be ready to shadow him when he takes off. I, too, would advise against closer inspection, I-5 agreed. Jax shook his head, frustration bubbling just under the surface of his calm. I can't pass up an opportunity like this. If we wait until he lifts off, our chances of being able to trace him aren't all that good. We'd still be taking a shot in the dark. And if you get too close to him on the ground, you'll be taking a chance that he'll sense you, if he hasn't already, argued I-5. Better a shot in the dark than a shot in the head. If he'd sensed me, he'd have come after me. The landing zone would be crawling with Inquisitors. But he's sent his most effective Inquisitors off-world, I need to know where they've gone. Jax eyed Din, who was standing in front of the hatchway, blocking his path. Are you going to let me out? I shouldn't, growled the Sullustan. I think this is a crazy idea. I'll be in disguise. No one's going to suspect a police officer of being Jedi. Nobody but Darth Vader, maybe, Din said. Jax laid a hand on his shoulder and met his worried gaze. I'll be careful. Trust me. Okay? You I trust. I'm not sure about anyone else. What if that uniform Howells gave you is a flag? What if it's been wired or chipped? I checked for chips. What if Vader knew you'd do something like this and had Howells give you the uniform you thought would give you safe passage? What if... Jax squeezed the Sullustan's shoulder and shook him gently. Din, we can't distrust everyone. If Howells were a double agent, he'd have brought Whiplash down by now. He's had repeated opportunities to do so. I trust him. You should, too. Din exhaled, nodded, and stepped aside. All right, he said but I'd like to go on record as saying that I've got a bad, noted and logged. Jax went to his quarters and changed into the uniform. A few minutes later, Lieutenant Pell Quinn left the ship and headed for the palace district, a large diplomatic pouch slung over one shoulder. 12. The Imperial Palace grew up out of the crust of Coruscant, like a malignant coral reef, a mountain of native stone, duracrete, and transparasteel, with a crown of spires that reached greedily into the sky. The Senate District, Security Bureau, and Eastport were mere satellites of the massive structure and existed in its shadow. Though many kilometers away from the palace itself, Jax still felt as if the ISB sat atop the world and watched. 
Shaking off the sensation, he looked away from the palace and turned his attention to the forecourt of the Imperial Security Bureau. Guards were plentiful. Fortunately, they were all Imperial guards, and all human, with not a force sensitive among them. Farther in, with Vader in residence, there would be stormtroopers and inquisitors. Jax was prepared for that. He crossed the broad plaza without hesitation and approached the first checkpoint that would require him to present identification. He offered his identichip, keeping the force tightly coiled within him. He'd added blonde hair and blue eyes to his disguise. His own master wouldn't have recognized him. The guard, a human, scanned the identichip, obviously bored. Boredom was good. Lieutenant Quinn? That's right. The guard raised an eyebrow. From the Z Cree sector, I don't think I've seen you before. Where is the usual courier, Sergeant? What's his name? Jax met the question with the most subtle tendril of the force possible. I've been on this duty for months. I carry the most important dispatches. You've seen me here before. The man looked up into Jax's eyes and frowned. Wait, I know you. I've seen you here before. He glanced at the diplomatic pouch. That must be quite important. Not something a prefect would task a sergeant with. Jack smiled and stepped through the checkpoint. Exactly. So, what is it, Lieutenant? What's in the pouch? His core, suddenly twenty degrees colder, Jack's turned on his heel, a plastic smile on his face. You know? I have no idea. They hand me a bag and they say, Take this to security. He shrugged. It's all I need to know. And I don't. Just a beast of burden, I guess. The guard laughed. Aren't we all? Jax moved across the broad permacrete courtyard, feeling the tiniest wriggle of concern that perhaps Vader was strong enough to sense even that infinitesimal use of the Force. He hoped not. If there were any Inquisitors about... Their emanations would surely mask it. On the other hand, if he met one of them, well, he'd just have to think fast. He knew that the ISB's internal landing platforms were fairly deep within the complex. He also knew that security would be much tighter there. It was a chance he'd have to take. He kept his head up and his steps confident. What he wanted was a vantage point, from which he could see Vader's transport clearly. A vantage point like the one offered by the high walkway that ran between the control tower and the hangar bays that housed the Bureau's contingent of stealth fighters. The only problem was that to reach it, he'd have to pass through the offices of airspace control. He'd planned for that. Jax made his way to the interior of the bureau, presenting his credentials to a series of guards. When he was confronted with his first stormtroopers, he knew he was getting close to the goal. He strode briskly up to the checkpoint and presented his identichip. The stormtrooper's assessment of Jax's ID was perfunctory at best. He barely glanced at the data strolling across the screen of his reader. He didn't cross-check it with security files, which would have revealed that Lieutenant Pell Quinn had retired over a year ago and moved to Corellia. Stifling a yawn, he handed the identichip back to Jax, who received it with what he hoped was commensurate amount of boredom and moved on. Almost too easy, he thought. Then, just beyond the stormtrooper's checkpoint, he was confronted with a whole set of choices. Left, right, and straight on. A short flight of natural stone steps led down into a broad, high-ceilinged gallery that was different from what had come before. 
This was the oldest section of the ISB complex, and also the most secure. The ribs of the gallery's vaulted expanse were durasteel and clearly intended to withstand a major assault. A sign at the far end of the corridor proclaimed this area to be ISB Airspace Control. Jax glanced left. An armored archway led to the offices of airspace security. To the right, a set of thick doors led out into a manicured garden courtyard that flanked the gallery. He could see the full length of it through the transparisteel windows that ran down the right-hand side of the hallway, admitting a shimmering wash of natural light. The garden contained sculpted foliage, walkways, and benches placed so the visitor could admire the statues and moving holographic images of imperial heroes. Jax recognized an Aluma bronze sculpture of Palpatine in his Senate robes, as well as one of Fao Ji, the hero of the Drangaran occupation. No doubt there was an effigy of the Emperor in one of his guises in every display of statuary in the complex. Jax started down the steps, head high, stride certain, the model of a policeman and official courier. He'd gone only a few steps when he felt a ripple in the force. A moment later, the doors of the control center glided open and a hooded figure stepped out across the threshold. An inquisitor. For Jax, time slowed to an impossible crawl, though his feet still moved him forward. He could not pass the Inquisitor in such close quarters. A particularly adept one would almost certainly sense that there was something different about this particular policeman, and while Vader had ostensibly sent his best and brightest off-world, all Inquisitors were, by virtue of their station, high-level adepts. Jax stopped. With a feigned air of annoyance, he produced his comly and pretended to be speaking to someone. As the Inquisitor moved toward him, down the long gallery, Jax turned and exited through the right-hand doors into the courtyard, continuing to ask questions of a pretend superior on the other end of the link. He kept walking until he had put the statue of Palpatine between himself and the Inquisitor. He could see through the arched windows along this side of the corridor that the other Force user did not hesitate, but exited the hall without even a nod at the troopers guarding it. Jax sat on a bench in the lee of the statue, still pretending to be in conversation with someone, and scanned the garden courtyard. There was another door at the far end, diagonal to the flight control entrance. That was the only other access. He had no doubt there were cams everywhere in this restricted area. Under normal circumstances, they wouldn't be a problem. He could make them see what he wanted them to see, but with Vader so near, Jax wished, for the hundredth time, that he had some idea of what long-term effects the Boda had had on Vader's Force abilities. Not being able to gauge an adversary's resources accurately was nerve-wracking. Jax got up and paced around the statue of Palpatine, his eyes taking in the surveillance cams. Drawing on the merest breath of the Force, he calculated what was perhaps the only blind spot in the area and made for it, his steps meandering as if he were more intent on his feigned dialogue than where he was putting his feet. If he'd had more time, he would have tried to procure some thousand scales to mask his force signature. But he should have thought of that back at the market. He had what he had, his own native intelligence and creativity, the force, and the fact that there were other Force users in the complex whose presence would offer some camouflage. Between two holograms of some long-dead Imperial luminaries, which screened him from two holocams, and blocked from a third by a bronze freeform sculpture of some iconic meaning he couldn't begin to guess at, 
Jax pocketed his comm link and pulled a long hooded robe out of the diplomatic pouch. It took him mere seconds to draw the robe on over his uniform and pull the cowl down over his face. Pell Quinn, police lieutenant, disappeared. It was an inquisitor who stepped out from between the holograms and re-entered the gallery at the far end, the diplomatic pouch hidden beneath his robes. The doors to flight control slid open, and he strode inside. Jax took a moment to orient himself. Before him was a pristine room filled with ISB functionaries. Beyond them, a huge expanse of transparisteel looked down on the landing stages. He could see the shaft of the control tower at the far right, the walkway stretching from it to the hangar bays. Straight ahead, the wingtips of a Lambda-class long-range shuttle peeked above the railing of the walkway. He might, he realized, actually be able to see the landing platform from the windows right here in the offices. But, Inquisitors didn't, as a rule, tend to loiter around staring out windows. He turned right and made his way to a set of doors that would take him outside and allow him access to the base of the control tower. There were two more stormtroopers stationed at the tower entry. They didn't even look at him as he passed by. In fact, both averted their gazes. But once inside the tower, he realized his dilemma. A Jedi could manipulate a sentient being, but he could not control a turbolift AI that was asking for his security clearance before allowing him to ascend. Jax considered going back outside and force jumping to the walkway, then discarded that as too great a risk. The area was too open. The guards would have to be distracted. There must be emergency stairs. He had turned to look for those when the turbo lift behind him was activated from above. The lift was going up. Jax moved swiftly to the doors and pried them open. High above his head, the lift continued to ascend the fifty or so floors toward the top. The walkway access was half that distance. Jax swung himself into the lift tube and force jumped. He'd no more than left the ground when he realized the lift had stopped short of the top and was descending again, swiftly. Time slowed to a crawl for the second time that day. Jax's gaze sought the doorway to the level he needed to reach. He would get there at approximately the same time the lift would. There was no escape that way. Nine or ten meters from the first floor... He reached out with both hands and called the force to his fingertips, just enough to buffer his impact with the descending lift. It was still a bone-jarring jolt, one he was sure the occupants to the lift car felt. Grasping the undercarriage, Jax let momentum carry his body into contact with the steel box. His feet found purchase on a crossbar that ran along one edge. Air rushed by him roaring in his ears as the lift descended. The long robe he defected was molded to his body, the hood obscuring his vision. He shook his head, and the hood lifted away. He almost wished he hadn't bothered. Now he could see the floor of the turbolift shaft rushing up to meet him. It'd be all right, he reminded himself, as long as the carriage didn't use the entire depth of the shaft to halt before bobbing back up to its stop. Of course, if he was really lucky, it would stop on the second level. He wasn't that lucky. The turbo lift shot down to the premier level, and its anti-gravity cushion engaged. Jax, caught in the field, was suddenly weightless. The cloak billowed. He held on with his entire will, knowing that gravity would return with a vengeance when they reached the bottom. The car dived below the first level exit, the ground floor rushing up to meet it. Jax coiled the force within him, knowing that if he had to use it to save himself, he would very likely give himself away. The lift stopped, and gravity reasserted itself. 
Jax felt at once the pull of the planet and the light pressure of a padded crossbeam against his back before the car bobbed lightly back up to the exit portal. It vibrated as its doors opened and its occupants exited. Now, would it just sit here until someone else called for it, or... The lift hummed. In moments, it was ascending again, with Jax still clinging to its underside. He watched the portals for each level as they slid by. He wanted level nine, and there it was. He swung his legs down and let go of the lift's undercarriage, then used the force, gently, oh so gently to slide down the curving wall of the shaft to the level 9 portal. There was just enough room for him to stand on the lip of the entry. He applied the minimum amount of effort to opening the doors and all but fell through them out onto the high walkway. In the lee of the tower, he adjusted his cloak and hood, then slid slowly down the sparkling length of permacrete until he could see the target. Vader's shuttle sat in the center of the largest landing stage, dwarfing the smaller vessels close to it. The Lambda-class shuttle, its wings folded, tips pointing skyward, was well-armed and well-guarded. Stormtroopers, no doubt members of Vader's fists, stood at intervals, facing outward as if to accost anyone who might approach the ship. Standard procedure? or evidence that there was a special passenger on this trip. Jax felt a chill down his spine. He'd been sweating during his encounter with the turbo lift, but now he was freezing cold. Did that shuttle contain Thizon Yemon? Was there any way he could find out without revealing himself? He'd been moving more and more slowly along the walkway, his head tilted as minimally as possible toward the shuttle. His spirit was not quiet. He wanted to fling himself over the parapet, rush to the ship, and tear it open to reveal what or who was inside. He willed himself to calmness, to dispassion. Impossible. He settled for focus. He had come here at great risk and could not go back without knowing something. Gritting his teeth, He reached questing tendrils of the Force sense toward the vessel, seeking Yemon. He applied himself to the bow of the ship first, reasoning that a prisoner of such importance would be kept in or near the detachable forward section of the vessel in case an emergency forced them to separate the bridge from the cargo and the passenger sections. His steps slowed further as he concentrated. There were people aboard the vessel— but their similar energies told him most were the cloned soldiers of Vader's guard. But here was a different signature. And there, he withdrew slightly. That, surely, was the thousand blurred energy of an Inquisitor. He moved on, feeling every inch of the vessel as if it were a model he held in his hands. He finished with a deep sense of disappointment. Maybe Yemon was in the building beneath Jax's feet. Maybe he simply hadn't been put aboard yet. Jax wanted Yemon to be here. Desperately, he now realized. He wanted. He had no further opportunity to consider what he wanted. The ramp of the ship was extending from the port side of the vessel. Two Imperial officers descended to stand at the lower end. Jax stopped walking and turned to face the ship. Below him, someone moved from the shadow of the walkway and strode toward the vessel in a swirl of black robes. Every hair on Jax's body stood on end. Vader. I should keep walking, Jax told himself. He should seem to be just one more Inquisitor going about his mysterious duties. He tried to make his feet move, but his gaze refused to let go of Vader. He had left his lightsaber aboard the Laranth and now regretted it. He could still throw himself over onto the landing platform. He didn't need the weapon to use the force effectively, something Laranth had always been at pains to remind him. 
She thought the Jedi were too obsessed with the uniformity as opposed to unity. You could have one without the other, she had argued. A Jedi shouldn't limit him or herself to a particular weapon or even a particular way of doing things. Successful life forms were also adaptable life forms. But Loranth was dead, and the man responsible for her death was, even now, crossing the Duracrete surface of the landing stage. Or was the man responsible standing atop this walkway, looking down at his nemesis? The thought struck Jax hard enough to make him take a step backward. Below, on the sun-washed platform, Darth Vader had paused to speak to the officers awaiting him at the bottom of the ramp. The conversation was brief and one-sided. At its conclusion, the Dark Lord took a step onto the landing ramp. Then he hesitated and turned to look up at the man on the walkway. One's face was obscured by a mask, and the other's by the shadows of an Inquisitor's hood. Yet still, Jax felt naked before the touch of Vader's regard. Do you know who I am? It took the full force of Jax Pavan's will to bow his hooded head deeply to the Dark Lord, then turn and resume his slow, gliding walk. He entered the flight control facility on the opposite side of the walkway. Only once inside did he quicken his pace. He passed one or two Inquisitors on his way out of the building. He did not acknowledge them in any way, nor they him. He passed through checkpoint after checkpoint, glad that the Inquisitors inspired such fear that the guards were reluctant to even look at him. When he left the bureau complex, he recrossed the broad plaza, the space between his shoulder blades itched. In his mind's eye, he saw that masked face with its obsidian goggles turned toward him, stripping away layers of skin and bone to ultimately bear his identity. Or so it had felt. But he didn't know me, Jax told himself. If he'd known me, he would have challenged me. He would never have let me walk out of there alive. If he'd known me, I would have felt it. Still in Inquisitor's guise, Jax returned to the Westport, hoping that by the time he got there, he would have stopped shaking. At the point Din realized he was checking the chrono every five minutes, he stopped glancing at it. Jax had been gone for over two hours without a word, and the Sullustan wished desperately, not for the first time in his life, that he wasn't stone deaf when it came to the Force. At least then, he told himself. He'd know if Jax was all right, or if he'd been discovered, or worse. Why didn't he take us with him, Five? The question had been revolving in his mind, since Jax had set off for the palace district. It was driving him crazy. He turned his gaze from the landing pad to look at the droid, who was tinkering with a new chassis design through his onboard hollow display. I mean, if Yemon was there, and Jax had any hope of rescuing him, he'd need backup, right? I-5 swiveled his head so that the oculus was aimed at Din. Jax may have reasoned that a lone Jedi would have a better chance of rescuing Yemon than a Jedi encumbered with a couple of miniature sidekicks. Okay, I can see why he might not take me, but I'm frankly not that quick or stealthy or impressive. But you, you're not a liability by any stretch of the imagination, especially since we got those laser units installed. You can do just about anything but fly. The droid's monocular optics spun as if in contemplation. Anti-gravity generators come in very small packages these days. With perhaps a repulsor unit for swift ascensions. Stop it, Din exclaimed. You're trying to distract me. What makes you think that? I know you, Tin Man. 
Din said, pointing a stubby digit at I-5's lens. You've been wondering the same thing, haven't you? Why would Jax leave you behind? I can't say that I have. Five shut off the hollow image of a souped-up I-5YQ unit. What I have been doing is sorting through possible reasons why he may have done this. The most obvious one is that he's afraid of putting us in harm's way. That's not his decision to make, Blasted. It's ours. It could be reasonably argued that someone had to stay with the ship, keep it liftoff ready. Like I said, I could have seen him leaving me here, but not you. He needs you, Five, probably more now than... Din broke off when a flicker of movement at the periphery of the landing platform tugged at his eye. What was that? I-5 turned his gaze to the exterior view. I saw nothing, which, given my monocular vision, is unsurprising. Din rose from the co-pilot's chair. It was there, over there by that fuel port. He pointed at the bright yellow housing of a robotic unit that dispensed liquid metal fuel. I-5 tapped the control panel and brought up the displays showing views starboard, port, and aft. Din flicked his gaze from one screen to the next. Are you sure? I-5 began. Yes, I'm sure. I'm there. Right there. A cloaked figure flitted from shadow to shadow, passing from the fuel port to the stairwell on the port side of the landing pad. Din felt as if every drop of blood in his body had congealed. An inquisitor, I-5 said with irritating calm. Perhaps we should let him know he's been seen. Din shook his head. No, let's just keep an eye on him. Or three. Let's not tempt fate, okay? What if Jax returns while he's out there? Mother of Sullust, he has to ask. Din licked his lips. We should ping Jax. And if he's doing something stealthy at the moment we ping him? We were instructed to keep radio silence. I hate this, Din said. A lot. They watched for several minutes as the Inquisitor made a circuit of the ship. Once, then twice. I don't get it said Din. What's he doing? Sniffing, perhaps, trying to see if he can smell a Jedi. That made sense, and it meant that if Jax returned while Vader's little force hound was out there, Din got up and slipped into the short corridor that connected the tiny bridge to the body of the ship. He popped open the weapons locker and took a blaster from the rack. What are you doing? I-5 was standing in the hatchway. I'm gonna chase him away. No, you're not. I am. The droid scuttled past Din and made for the airlock. He had let down the loading ramp before Din could get to him. With Din standing in the hatch, his heart beating hard enough to sway him back and forth, I-5 stalked down to the bottom of the ramp and looked around. Thieves! He squeaked in a high, tinny voice. I saw thieves, Captain Vigil. His head performed almost a 360-degree swivel before swinging back in the opposite direction. When his oculus was pointed away from the Inquisitor's last known position, he raised a slender arm, pointed a finger 180 degrees away from where he was looking, and fired a bolt of blue energy from his fingertip. It struck the housing of the umbilical cabling, now retracted, that had powered the ship's systems while she was docked. There was a sudden flurry of sound and movement, and then nothing. Or at least as much nothing as there could be on a landing stage at a busy spaceport. Den held his breath, blaster in hand, and tried to listen, to sense, the shadowy presence of the Inquisitor. It was a vain attempt, 
when it came to the force. Bender was an inert lump of protoplasm. I-5 moved into the shadow of the ship's keel. Perhaps, Captain, the droid said, you should go monitor the pad from the bridge. I'll stay down here, just in case. Uh, copy that. Din swallowed, then hastened back to his seat in the cockpit. He turned his eyes to one display after another, bow, port, starboard, aft. The shadows of the dockside equipment seemed almost solid in the glare of Coruscant's sun. He scanned every one of them, repeating the process once, twice, three times, before his heart rate began to assume a more normal rhythm. At the end of his third cycle, he closed his eyes and took a deep breath, wishing Jax would return, praying to the Great Mother that he would return with Yaman, and this nightmare would simply be over. I'm coming back aboard, Captain. I-5's voice came to him through the droid's comlink. Din took a breath of relief. Okay, okay, great. He opened his eyes to watch the little droid climb back up the landing ramp and saw the Inquisitor step out of the shadows of the spaceport directly behind him. Five, you're back, Din yelled, but I-5 couldn't hear him. In his panic, Din hadn't activated the comm. Still, the droid turned to face the Sith operative. Din saw the light on the laser port built into his oculus flash red as it charged up. The Inquisitor stopped, raising his hands as if to forestall attack, then put back his hood? Din all but melted into a puddle on the deck of the bridge. He was still lounging limply in his seat when I-5 and Jax entered. Jax had removed the Inquisitor's cloak and looked more or less as he had when he'd left earlier. Why did you do that? asked Din. Jax frowned. Do what? The... Words failing him, Din briefly pantomimed a hunched-over sinister form, large eyes narrowed to slits, finger crooked, claw-like. Oh, a precaution. Vader and his lackeys expect four signatures from Inquisitors, not members of the local constabulary. Okay, I get that, but why all the skulking around the ship? You afraid we might have picked up a bug or a bomb or something? I mean, you scared the Mopac out of us. Or, well, out of me, anyway. Jax's frown deepened. What skulking? I-5 made a soft beep. We've been monitoring an Inquisitor for the last 15 minutes or so, making a circuit of the ship. I thought I'd driven him off. We assumed... Jax's face had paled above his uniform. That wasn't me. I just got here.